I would like to call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, August 23rd. We will all rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Elasia, Liam, and Hannah Lancaster, their children of the acting uh, principal at Lock Raven High School, so we welcome them here. Uh, we will remain standing for a moment of sil silent meditation in memory of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I, ready? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And thank you for leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance this evening. Our first item is our agenda for the evening. Um, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda, Dr. Dance? There are none. Hearing none, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Uh, our agenda is set for tonight. Our next item is to is our selection of speakers for the evening. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting to 10. Each speaker is allotted three minutes to discuss his or her issue. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. If fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who sign up will be permitted to speak. The first speaker is Nancy Thomas. Number two is Stacy Duran. Number three, Maureen Simmons. Four, Natalie Smith. Five, Elizabeth Hepner. Six, Steve Wires. Seven, Jamal Moffat. Eight is an LLC, so I don't think we can have an LLC speak. Um, this is number eight? Mm -hmm. Number eight, Bosch Verone. Number nine, Muhammad Jamil. And number 10, Alice Myers. Thank you very much. Then we'll move to our next agenda item, which is public comment. Uh, this is one of the opportunities we provide to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens and will take your comments into consideration even though it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues which are raised. When appropriate, we will refer your comments to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and the school system, this is not the proper avenue to address specific student concerns or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. I would, like, I would like to remind the public the inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to, to observe our timer, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time has expired. Um, at this time, we'll start our public comment portion by hearing from our advisory groups. And uh, our first speaker for tonight is the Baltimore County Student Council President, Ms. Jordan Wilson. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So uh, since I last saw you guys, the Baltimore County Student Council's Executive Board has been very hard at work. Um, we've spent the past month planning basically for the entire year ahead. We spent countless hours uh, getting together and just making sure that everything goes as smoothly as possible as we begin the school year. 
Uh, so last Tuesday, we actually had our executive board retreat, which is a time for all of our exec board members to get to know each other, um, to work on team building, to set goals for the year, and basically just plan out all of our exciting events that uh, we look forward to hosting later on. Um, so that day went very well. It went very smoothly. Um, we're really looking forward to uh, working with all of those members. And then this Saturday, we also have our camp staff training for the uh, annual fall leadership camp that we host later on in September. So we've been hard at work planning that and getting all those workshops together and getting student inputs um, and just basically preparing for that big event. So we're very excited to have that and uh, we're looking forward to start the year off tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. It's good to hear from you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Abby Baton from Tabco. Good evening, Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board. Maybe. On the eve of welcoming our students, we all wait in anticipation with strong convictions as we look forward to the upcoming school year. We teachers understand the importance of our time spent with our students as well as the time spent preparing to work with our students. As always, our students' well-being is what drives us to do our very best. As I have said before, time is a commodity. We spend it in many ways just like we spend money and just like money there is a finite amount of time available. It is concerning to us that we continue to have initiatives added to our plates without others being removed. The perfect example is yesterday's sixth and ninth grade transition. While we feel this is a great way to start the year for those students transitioning to a new school setting, there was no extra time allowed for teachers to add this to their start of the year preparations. Even though students were not having actual lessons taught at that time, it still takes lots of preparation to make ev sure everything is in place and that the rooms are ready two days in advance of the normal time frame. It also means that one, more than one half of one of those planning days is used for this activity. This is time the teachers would normally spend getting ready for the school year. There was nothing taken away from their already busy time planning for the school year, and yet they were expected to add this event to the, this time. Was our contract broken? No. However, the expectation the teachers will give of their own time is very real. Go to schools during the summer and you will find many of our teachers working in their classrooms because they want to get it right for their students. I know because I used to spend time in my classroom before school began without any compensation. Of course, that was my choice, but as more and more additional items are added to teachers' plates without anything else being removed, more and more will feel compelled to do what I did. We need more support for teachers' work. There should be a secretary dedicated to helping teachers with those tasks that teachers spend time completing that someone else could be doing, someone who doesn't need a teaching degree to do so. We have paralegals for lawyers, but no one to help teachers. If we really believe that our teachers are the most important ingredient in a child's education, we must support them in a manner befitting the importance of their work. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baton. Our next speaker is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, Ms. Megan Stewart Sicken. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Over this past summer, since being elected chair of the CCAC, I have spent a lot of time in individual and committee meetings, visited curriculum writing twice, and visited an all staff meeting of the Office of Special Ed. During all this time, I've met very talented and dedicated teachers and administrators. But there's one serious question that arose for me while I was visiting the curriculum writing. I've talked a lot about struggling readers lately, so just stick with me for a minute because I'm going to talk about something else too. I spent time with my co-chair sitting around a particular table that was working on a remedial reading course. While we were impressed by what we saw being developed, it became evident in our conversation that some of the resources they were using were not things that are shown to work for children with dyslexia. After more observation, I found myself in the strange situation of realizing that those writing the curriculum for the remedial reading class didn't have a full knowledge base about different types of struggling readers and interventions. In general, I left with impressions of great teachers working really hard to write, revise, and provide resources for our teachers. 
but there was a pretty large missing piece of the puzzle. With our teachers expected to reach so many types of students every day, why isn't special education staff playing a part in curriculum writing? Perhaps in the past, many modifications and accommodations were incorporated over time, but now we have new standards, new curriculum, new technology. And while all this new stuff is being produced, at least as far as I saw, special education did not have input on the front end. Often the Office of Special Ed is called in after the fact when students are having trouble. It seems to me that they should absolutely have a place at the table when it's being produced. Perhaps more modifications offered up front would support our classroom teachers and provide more immediate resources. In any case, with the sheer variety of students and needs in our classrooms, it feels to me like a pretty large oversight to have special ed left out of the planning and production of curriculum. Making sure special education is included in curriculum writing is imperative as we continue to generate new material. This is not a budgetary issue. It does not need to involve a multi-year process to fix it. And I don't think it's something that needs me coming back here over and over again to talk about, I hope. This is an easy fix that can happen now and can certainly happen before curriculum writing next summer. I officially ask the board and Dr. Dance to refer this matter to the appropriate person and office which makes decisions about how curriculum writing is organized and I ask for follow-up so I know who else I need to speak with in order to make this happen by next summer. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is from Case, uh, Mr. Bill Lawrence. Mr. McDaniels, Mr. Gillis, yeah. Dr. Yeah. Dance, members of the board. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is thank the administration for my invitation, uh, which I gladly accept to attend the first day of school. Uh, tomorrow I've been attending first day of school now for 63 years, so uh, <laughs> I get pretty excited. <laughs> I get pretty excited about the first day of school. The really good thing about tomorrow is, is that um, I don't have t uh, to prepare lesson plans or to stand in the bus loop and direct students to their, uh, their new homerooms. Uh, the other reason I'm here this evening is Chapter 480 um, of uh, the Maryland Annotated Code, which uh, I forwarded to Ms. Decker earlier, uh, and you should now have. Uh, it is an important piece of legislation uh, passed two years ago and does not take full implementation for another two years. However, as you, or at least as I, um, read the, the, the law, it is absent what I call an ignition <coughs> point. And by that I mean there are important activities that must happen before uh, the new board is constituted. And the law seems to be missing a by date that uh, it, for example, requires that um, each of 19 groups, case is one of those groups, appoint a member to the school board nominating uh, commission but it doesn't talk about when that should happen or to whom uh, that should um, go. Uh, there are elections uh, to be held and those elections happen in um, 18, but it doesn't talk about when we begin the process. Several of you, for example, uh, will stand for election. Some of you are grandfathered in and some of you um, um, must run again. Um, and it doesn't talk about how exactly that process uh, it talks about the governor working in consultation with the county executive to appoint members, to appoint a chairman. I see Mr. Former Senator Collins smiling at that conversation. Uh, but that's what the law says. The law says that there will be collaboration between uh, branches of government and th those members uh, appointed. The, the governor ha is authorized to appoint four members to the commission. Uh, he is also authorized to appoint a chair. Uh, to that commission. As someone who was staff for the original school board nomination commission 25 years ago, uh, this is not an easy task. This is something that I think we need to get started. The other reason is that uh, CASE supports elected officials. Uh, we do a survey, we contribute money, uh, I send out uh, letters encouraging members uh, to vote for various people running for elected office in Baltimore County and I would assume we would do the same thing for members uh, of the school board. 
I bring that up because there are people already running for school board without any of that. So, in my final remark, since I got, just got buzzed, uh, I would just ask uh, that the administration and this board sort of look around and see what's the ignition point. Where should we, uh, as people seeking to be involved in the process, go to be involved uh, in the formation of uh, the school board nominating commission? Thank you very much for having a great opening of school. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Our next speaker is from the Northeast Area Education Advisory Council, uh, Ms. Julie Hen. Good evening. I'd like to concede part of my time to Councilman David Marks, who is joining us, if I may. Well, he's, he's welcome to come up, but um, you don't have to concede any time. You can take your full three minutes if you'd like. Great. Thank you, Mr. McDaniels. Good evening, um, Mr. McDaniels, Dr. Dance, members of the board. On behalf of the Northeast Advisory, I would first like to thank you for your commitment to fund the construction of two Northeast elementary schools. We must now turn our attention to the area's middle and high schools, both of which have urgent needs due to overcrowding from overcrowded feeder schools. Perry Hall Middle enrollment hit 106% capacity this last year and is projected to climb to 125% capacity by 2024 in just seven short academic years. Enrollment will soar from 1,737 students to 2,048. But what do these numbers really mean for our students? It's hard enough to thrive academically without having to face the unique challenges faced by enrollment in an overcrowded school. Last night I attended my daughter's sixth grade back to school night at Perry Hall. I'm glad I don't have to navigate those halls every day. But crowded halls are just the beginning. Perry Hall is out of classroom space. There are 14 floating teachers this year. Every inch of usable non-classroom space is in use and portables are on the way. Imagine eating lunch at 10 a.m. 450 students at Perry Hall do that every day and they don't have the opportunity to hit the vending machines in the afternoon when they get hungry. Personalized instruction is an unrealistic goal with core class sizes of 32 and growing and special classes exceeding 36. When my son attended the school three years ago, his band class had 62 students. Hmm. He played clarinet and was frustrated and ready to give up playing because he couldn't get the personalized help he needed. No school can run effectively without adequate numbers of administrative and support staff. Perry Hall students who fall ill routinely text their parents first before they go to the nurse because they know they face wait times of an hour or more to see one nurse who serves 1,800 students. Perry Hall's outstanding leadership and PTSA continue to rise to these challenges through creativity and hard work, but this is not sustainable. They need your support and we need long-term solutions. Given that it may take three to five years to complete a new middle school, we need to begin now. We ask that a new middle school site be identified as soon as possible, and we also ask that the board work with the county executive to se secure funding for, uh, um, sorry, in next year's budget for the design of a new middle school. The time to act is now. Thank you for your time and attention, and I'll turn it over to Councilman Marks. Thank you, Ms. Hen. And Ms. you don't have to rush through here. We're glad to see you, Councilman, and uh, Thank you. we're always w glad when our elected officials stop in the, the board meeting, so you have the floor. and. Take your time. Thank you. Thank you very much for your service and the outstanding work you're doing in preparation for tomorrow. Julie said it very well. Uh, the need is there right now to begin designing a new middle school. Um, I am doing my part as part of the comprehensive zoning map process uh, by down zoning thousands of acres in my district. And we'll be making an announcement about that very soon in the Perry Hall area. I also do want to bring your attention to the other planning need in the Towson area, the replacement of Towson High School, uh, which was built in 1949 and which is projected to be at 137% capacity uh, around 2021. Both are important needs. We're not asking for the construction money right now just to begin planning for replacements or new, new school in, in terms of the Northeast. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, we'll move into our uh, public comment of the speakers. Uh, and our first speaker for this evening is Nancy Thomas.
I don't know if she's still here. She might be in an adjacent room. You know, I'll just switch the order and call. Our second speaker is Stacy Duran, and then we'll move back to Ms. Thomas. If Stacy Duran is here. Is uh, Maureen Simmons in this room? Okay, Ms. <laughs> and we'll, we'll uh, reverse the order back uh, to get our first couple speakers. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Maureen Simmons and I would like to take just a few minutes to discuss the transportation routing issues that we as parents have been dealing with. I have two sons attending uh, middle and high school and they ride bus number 659. Uh, this, this route is among the many that have changed this year and as a result of the change, my children will have to ride the bus for an extra 25 to 30 minutes each morning. Um, not only will they need to ride the bus longer, but as the route is scheduled currently, the bus picks up my children at 628, continues for several stops and then loops back past the same stop almost a half an hour later. Um, so essentially my children will be riding on the bus for about 25 minutes in a loop. Um, when I noticed the route change, I called Transportation Central Office, I explained my issue with the new route and questioned if my children could be picked up on the second pass or to avoid extra riding time. My frustration came in because I was told that someone from the office would call me back. Um, it took over a week to actually get somebody to speak to me. Um, I was pass along to a couple of different people, basically uh, to no avail. Um, I understand that these changes may have had to happen. I'm not sure exactly why, because there was no explanation for the, the route changes to me. It's just very frustrating and disappointing to have these ma major changes made without any kind of explanation for why. And there was absolutely no way to express any concerns about the changes. Um, the lack of communication from transportation regarding the new routes is just very frustrating. Um, it's just my hope that some of these routes can be reevaluated for their efficiency when questioned and maybe adjustments being made and, and there is absolutely dire need for improved transparency and communication in the transportation department. Thank you. Um, Ms. Simmons, what area of the county do you live? Uh, with Hereford. This? Okay, thank Hereford. you. Did either Ms. Thomas or Ms. Duran come in the room or? Okay. Our next speaker is uh, Natalie Smith. Um, how about uh, Elizabeth Hepner? I wonder if they can hear out there. No, that's a check. Um, somebody come? Okay. Um, the next speaker then is Steve Weirs. It's just not here, huh? Then the next name signed up is Jamal Moffitt. That's really strange, Steve. Yeah, right. He is in the other room? Okay. Great. Oh, that's okay. Take your time. <laughs> okay, um, good morning, Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, and members of the board. Nine days ago, two men walked out of a mosque in New York after praying. As they walked down the street, a man ran up behind them. Within minutes, two gunshots rang out. Neither the imam nor his assistant would survive. Hours later, Muslims would wonder how this could happen in broad daylight how this could happen in America. It is a sad fact of American history that in every generation, fear and mistrust have led to violence and discrimination. Whether it is anti-Catholic sentiment in the 1800s, anti-Semitism in the 1900s, or Islamophobia now, the marginalization of religious communities is a fact that cannot be denied. Yet it is equally true that in every generation, individuals have taken steps to promote inclusion and ensure equality. I tell you this because of the decision before you today the decision regarding the Muslim holidays of Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr. 
And this is an opportunity for you as board members, as educators, as parents, and as Americans to reaffirm your commitment to inclusion and equality and to stand against fear and bigotry. These decisions are never easy, nor are they meant to be. For the hundreds who have stood for tolerance, thousands have stood to oppose them. Yet we ask you not to forget the Muslim students, teachers, and parents who look to this decision and to you in hope. Every, and the reality is that every year that goes by without action on this issue is a, year, is a year in which American Muslims, your neighbors, your coworkers, and your students wonder whether we all are truly created equal. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Farron. Good evening to all. Good evening. Mr. Chairman, may I take my time? <laughs> <laughs> I guess when I become a councilman. <laughs> um, you know what I'm going to talk to you about? I'm not going to say I have been there for 20 years, but I have been. When Dr. Berger holiday committee recommended adoption of closing the schools on both Jewish and Muslim holidays. Nonetheless, the superintendent and the board at the time elected to ignore the Muslim holidays and approve only the Jewish holidays. Now, I and all the community in thousands that came since 2004 through today. We are really not envious. We are asking you for equality. And the reason for equality is because we want our children to be 100% Americans, not marginalized, not feeling inferior. The current climate is, is that Muslims are being discriminated against which is really adding another wave of discrimination to different minorities that come through this country. So with the absence of any uh, objective data to close only on the Jewish holidays, I ask you, as I asked you for 20 years, especially the last 12 years, on the principle of equality to close on both Eid al-Hatatr and Eid al-Adha. That principle of equality, I think, would be fair for everyone. Two Muslim holidays as school closing days equal two closing days for the Jewish holidays. You could choose one of one and one of the other. I think that's fair. One equals one. You could choose three of one and three of the other. But I know I'm being facetious, obviously. Um, but it is a principle of equality. And as a physician and as a citizen for 40 years in this county, I think it's really imperative on us to make the right choice. The board made a mistake 20 years ago. It's human to err, maybe one time, maybe two times. But to continue the error, I think that's wrong. I ask you for equality, and I'm really counting on you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farron. Our next speaker is Mohammed Jamil. That's not my speech. <laughs> <laughs> That's yours. <laughs> Good evening and peace. Good evening. Mr. Daniels, esteemed board members. Uh, for whatever reason, I don't see Dr. Dance. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> now you know how old I'm getting. <laughs> now you see how old I'm getting. Young man. Almost two decades ago, uh, the board was enlightened to discover that there were fellow citizens who happened to be Muslims. The board was also informed about the inequality of school closings on religious holidays. It's been a slow and a long road for the board to recognize the hardship 
faced by the first and now the second generation of Muslim families whose children are enrolled in this great Baltimore County school system. Please do not interpret our insistence on demanding equal rights as something to disrupt the status quo or an irritant. It's an attempt to change that very status quo, to move you out of your comfort zone and remove the blinders when you know you have all the data, that there has been a astronomical seismic change in demographics, even though no such criteria was used to grant the other religious holidays. It requires the leaders to make sure that there is no appearance of any discrimination or appearance of any injustice if you really want to maintain peace. It's not a rocket scientist that who needs to tell you that. Maybe he doesn't know the difference between peace and blowing up something, but that's a rocket scientist. As an educator, it's a greater responsibility to recognize that such inequality will only breed contempt. And we've seen that. Our history in the school system shows that, that when we discriminated against an entire race, we had discipline problems. There was a conscientious effort not to toe the line because they felt discriminated. Are they to be blamed? I don't think so. So learning from history is, as you know, more important than just reading the history. As we are now approaching the 21st century's middle part, I think it will behoove that you have taken the challenge. And I am very proud that this is the first board in the history of BCPS who has tackled this difficult position. And you have come to deliberate definitely with due diligence. And I hope that you will do justice by allowing and granting the closing of the school on those two holidays. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Mr. Jamil. Our next speaker is Alice Myers. That's very interesting. If uh, we don't have any further speakers for this evening, that uh, we'll move on to our next agenda item, uh, which is uh, new business. No. No. That, that was not one of the... No. We drew, Alice we drew individuals' names, and we, didn't, and we didn't select the LLC. That's what I heard. He was spelling it black in the box. So we've, we've uh, gone through the public comment portion. I'm sorry. Not, not that we have to follow our procedures for public comment. If you have a, a statement you'd like to leave with Ms. Decker, that's, uh, that's very appropriate. Thank you. So if we stop the ballot box uh, and nobody comes up to speak, there are no speakers? You've had, oh. you've had oh. five or six people that signed up and they didn't show up. So yeah, I don't understand what that was about. but. All right, our next agenda item is personnel matters, and I'll call forth Dr. Mayo. Good evening, Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chair Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board. Good evening. Good evening. I would like board consent for the following personnel matters, resignations, and leave, leaves of absence. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Do I have a motion to approve exhibits F1 and F2? So moved. Moved. A second? Second. Is there any discussion? 
If not, if all those uh, in favor of approving these items, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Any abstentions? The motion carries now. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Mayor. Our next item is new business, administrative appointments. I'll call on Dr. Dance. Chairman McDaniels, members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Principal of Wellwood International School, Assistant Principal Cadenceville Center for Alternative Studies, Assistant Principal Deer Park Elementary, Assistant Principal Lock Raven High School, Assistant Principal Millbrook Elementary School, Coordinator of School Counseling, Coordinator of Professional Growth and Partnerships, and Compliance Specialist in the Office of Title I. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Do I have a motion to approve administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit G? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Ms. Causey? I'm abstaining. Thank you. Thank the you. motion carries. Ms. Causey abstained. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Thank you, Chairman McDaniels. We'd like to introduce uh, several new members uh, of the Team BCPS to their new roles. Currently, the psychologist for Newtown Elementary School and going to be the assistant principal for Millbrook Elementary School, that's Candace Turner. <laughs> Candace, do you have any family or friends here with you this evening? Perfect. Your mom and your principal can stand so we can recognize the entire group. <laughs> Congratulations on your promotion, Candace. Next is for the principal of Wellwood International School and currently right now an assistant principal of Warren Elementary School. I should say currently right now the interim principal at Wellwood International School. That's Jody O'Neill. Congratulations. Do you have any family or friends here with you this evening? Congratulations on your promotion, Jody. Great job, Jason. <laughs> Next is for the assistant principal at Lock Raven High School. Currently, right now, the stat teacher at Lock Raven High School. That's William Lancaster. <laughs> and William, as we're starting our day at Lock Raven High School in the morning, congratulations to you. <laughs> Do you have any family or friends here with you tonight other than your proud principal, Bonnie Lambert? <laughs> she stood up before you even said her name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. They can all stand up so we can recognize the entire family. <laughs> Congratulations. Next is for the assistant principal position at Cadenceville Center for Alternative Studies. Uh, currently right now a resource teacher at Silos Point Technical High School. That's John Cluck. other than your principal, Joel Ralph, here with you tonight. Do you have any other family or friends with you? Yes, my wife is a teacher here for middle schools with me tonight. Well, please, she can stand so we can recognize you too. Congratulations to you. <laughs> Ms. Ralph is happy, so congratulations to you. Next is for the coordinator of professional growth and partnerships, currently right now, an assistant professor in the Department of Special Education at Towson University. That's Dr. Elizabeth Burkweiss. Dr. Burkwitz, do you have any family or friends with you tonight? I do. I have my fabulous new boss, Mr. Billy Burke. <laughs> <laughs> my uh, husband, who is a behavior interventionist at Towson High School, and my mom, who is a retired Baltimore County principal, and this young man in front of me, who is really here for his fabulous new age, is also my little brother. Oh. <laughs> oh <yeah. laughs> so, so the entire family can stand so we can recognize each of you. Congratulations. <laughs> Last but not least, the coordinator of uh, school counseling, the office of school counseling, currently right now a specialist in the office, is Dr. Hope Beyer. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Beyer, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? I have my wonderful family. I have my husband, Mike, and my daughter, two of my children, my daughter, Julian Aubrey. Congratulations to each of you. And congratulations to the entire group on your promotions, and thank you to your family for your support. We truly appreciate it. Have a great opening. Thank you, and congratulations to all those. 
Uh, our next item is a new business action taken in closed session, and I'll call forth uh, Mr. Nussbaum. Good evening. Good evening. Earlier this evening, the Board of Education considered four appeals regarding confidential employee and student matters in its quasi-judicial capacity. One was an oral argument where the board actually heard from a counsel for both parties. Three were considered on the record as there were no requests for oral arguments. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions taken in closed session in those matters which were uh, the oral argument was hearing examiner number 15-50. The summary affirmances were 16-61, 16-65, and 16-66. Thank you, Mr. Nussbaum. Um, do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay, moving this to any discussion at this time. If not, I'd ask all in favor of approving uh, the action we take token in closed session, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, and the Thank orders you. will be on the table. Thank you, Mr. Nussbaum. Thank you. All right, our next agenda item is also new business, the Maryland State Board of Education recommendations, and for that I'll call forth Dr. Brown. Good evening, Chair McDaniels, Vice Chair Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board and the community. Um, I'm here this evening to ask um, your approval for a series of recommendations regarding um, the final report of the commission on assessments. Uh, the commission had worked for the better part of a year reviewing assessment uh, in the state of Maryland, both at the state and local level, and they put together a report which has been included in your packet, and you, you've had an opportunity to review that. And we have a fairly limited uh, set of recommendations tied to that. I'd like to start first by discussing uh, BCPS's framework uh, or principles that we've used to guide assessment. And these principles have actually been in place for the past three years. So the first of which is that uh, we strongly believe that assessments should have a very clear peer purpose um, and that should be able to be articulated very clearly to all constituents. Um, connected to that um, is the idea that you know, the value of an assessment, of the value of the data, needs to be, exceed the, uh, the value of the instructional time that's given up for that assessment. Uh, oftentimes, people are very frustrated with the amount of time that's given up for assessment uh, relative to the data or the immediacy of the data that comes from it. And so we've been driven really by this idea of trying to make sure that the assessments are actually worth the time that we're giving up for them. Um, unfortunately, assessment mechanics matter. So, you know, when we think about the tools that we use for assessment, it can impact how quickly we have data and how useful that data is. And so the mechanics, again, of the assessment really matter, and we have to be thoughtful about that. And again, that's been a driver of our work over time. And finally, uh, and maybe one of the most important things that we could talk about, assessments should support our work around equity. Um, that they, they should be demonstrated to be fair and work equi equitably across all student groups and uh, to help us m measure learning over time for all our students and be accurate measures of growth. And it's really been the driver of our work. So I was really pleased when I saw the report come back from, from the commission and you will see these themes echoed in that report. Many of these same concepts exist within this report. And so we had very, very little to say about this report because overall it's very consistent with the principles that we've been drive, using to drive assessment in this system over time. That being said, uh, we really have a limited set of uh, things that we would recommend. There is one uh, recommendation in the report that we would uh, eliminate, and that's 3.1, and I'll get into that here in a moment. A couple that we would modify slightly and two that we like, and we like them so much we'd actually like to see them extended a little bit. We'd like to see them do a little bit more than what they, they had recommended. So starting with 3.1, we'll just sort of work through these in order. 3.1, uh, acknowledge that assessment, and particularly summative assessment for, um, for accountability purposes, can really have a footprint on, uh, on instructional time. And what I think folks were trying to do with this is free up teacher time with this. And what they were recommending is that we could loosen the restrictions on who could administer assessments. Unfortunately, um, we can't agree with that. Uh, we think it's, it's really important uh, that um, 
students, uh, because the history of the students do better when they are provided assessments by the teachers that they know. And that oftentimes the students who are the most needy, those who need accommodations, um, need the accommodations that are typically provided in instruction, the, the types of accommodations that they're provided on a daily basis by their teacher. And, and again, it's really hard for somebody to come in and provide those types of accommodations for a student if they don't know them, if they're not trained to do that. And finally, one of the things that's really, I think, very clear throughout this report, uh, they make it very clear that assessment really isn't something separate from instruction. Assessment is a part of an instructional task. And when we start to sub set out assessment as being somehow separate from uh, instruction, I think we diminish the role of a teacher and we diminish the importance of that. Teachers are trained to provide assessments and they're trained to provide the accommodations for them. So this is the one that we would eliminate. The next two we would ask that we modify. Uh, number 4.2 um, is uh, recommends the establishment of a practitioner group, group to inform the development of assessment plans across the state as a whole. I think it's a lovely idea and the, and the language in the report focuses on very local uh, representation, so principals and teachers, and I think that's great. However, in large systems like ours, I think it's really important that we have a, a system-wide voice at the table. Our local accountability coordinators not only know what happens in an individual building, but also know what has happened in a variety of buildings across the system. This would be true for us, Anne Arundel, any of the large systems. I think it's very important that they have a system-wide voice at the table so that it's not just the uh, peculiarities of a given building, but the things that have happened across the system as a whole that, that could be represented. So we would ask that this role be named as a member of this group. Moving on to 5.1. Again, this is a modification of the language. Um, a big push of this was to limit assessment time and to be very transparent about assessment time. We are fully supportive of the idea of being transparent about assessment time. I think our, our students, our teachers, our parents, our constituency should know how much time is spent in assessment, uh, and particularly in the mandated assessments for accountability purposes. So, you know, they require or ask that we disaggregate that and disaggregate that in a variety of ways. And I think that makes a lot of sense. However, I am concerned when they ask for us to disaggregate it for students who are receiving accommodations on an assessment. I am worried that that actually acts as a disincentive for providing accommodations. Students who are legally afforded accommodations um, deserve that time, and we shouldn't and again, the time spent for that varies substantially based on the accommodation of the student. I, I don't know how you can make an apples to apples comparison with this, and I am concerned about the disincentive to providing students time for the accommodations that they need. And so I think it's just the right thing for kids. So absolutely support the idea of reporting out on time, but I don't think we should build something in that could potentially um, incentivize people not to provide students what they deserve. Moving on to the two that we would love to see extended. So we really like both of these and we'd just like to see these ideas extended a bit. In 7.1 and 7.2, they're dedicated to PARC and dedicated to the reporting of PARC. And they're dedicated to the idea of comparability. 7.1 looks at the idea of do the results in 14-15 in mean the same thing as the results in 15-16, so comparability across years. And then uh, in 7.2, it's getting really at that mode effect. I've heard you guys talk about that before. It, it hit the media. It was this idea that, you know, if it was given on paper and given electronically, do those scores mean the same thing? Uh, and how can we report that in a way to help people understand what differences exist based on the, the mode of the administration? In both cases, we support this. Um, however, with 7.1, while they give a lot of evidence of things that they've done to plan to show that there's comparability between 14, 15, and 15, 16, we would like to see the evidence that that actually worked. Because there was a lot of language out there saying that they planned for the mode effect, but we know that that didn't work the way they intended. So while there's the planning's there, let's see that the evidence is that this, the scores are actually stable and mean the same thing from year to year. And in terms of the mode effect, I uh, really commend them for, for uh, recommending that the data get reported separately, report paper, report electronics, so that apples to apples comparisons can finally be made. 
what we would recommend in terms of extending that, because it's not clear in the language, maybe they intended it, but it's not explicit in the language, extend that to the LEAs. Extend that disaggregation of the data down to the LEAs and extend it down to student subgroups and, and student service groups so that when we think about accountability the way we traditionally have been able to do it, uh, allow us to be able to make those comparisons between LEAs in an apples to apples way. Because right now with the combination of the paper and the electronic versions, one can't. So in that case we would again advocate that, you know, that this is a really good idea but let's e extend it so that we can do apples to co apples comparisons. So again, in conclusion, um, really very thankful for the work that the Commission's done. It's very much in alignment with the work that we've been doing inside BCPS to this date. Um, it aligns very well to our assessment principles. Again, very limited uh, suggestions on that. Again, let our teachers test. Let's support students and allow them to have the time that they need for accommodations. Those students who really need accommodations, let's make sure they have that time. Let's assure that our accountability measures are valid, that, that when we're talking about changes in test scores, we're talking about changes in student learning. We're not talking about changes in the mode of the test, we're not talking about changes in the scaling from year to year, but we're talking about changes in student learning over time. And finally, uh, let's uh, ensure that large systems really have a voice at the table. Uh, it, it's great that, that we're talking about having teachers and practitioners at the table, I think that's, uh, that's lovely, but let's also ensure that large systems have a voice at the table as well. That in total is, is our sum, summary of our recommendations for this. And with that, I, again, I would ask your approval. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'd ask at this time if there are questions for Dr. Brown. Um, Mr. Collins? Yes, Dr. Brown. Um, on 4.2, um, I have a question or two. Um, the recommendation in the report refers to a statewide practitioner stakeholder advisory group. Mm -hmm. What is, what's the definition of a statewide practitioner? So as they named groups in that, I, I believe that they named principals and teachers as statewide practitioners. I think that they meant to have representation across the state. I don't know that they defined the term statewide practitioner. And you're, uh, are, we, are we suggesting that we have the local accountability coordinator from every county as part of this advisory group, or what are we suggesting here? I would suggest that as a member of that statewide practitioner group, that at least one local accountability coordinator from one of the larger systems be present to get at system level issues. Now ideally, it would be lovely if every local accountability coordinator could be part of that as well. It doesn't say, in or maybe I missed it, but it doesn't say how large this no, it group doesn't. is going to be or anything. There, and again, due to the lack of specificity, again, what we're encouraging here is just naming a specific role that would represent a large, large organization like our own. Uh, and again, I'm not uh, sure, <coughs> sure that, that the answer is even available. Um, would this be an appropriate advisory group for there, to, for there to be any membership of board members, parents, or students who take the tests? Or would that be uh, something that would not fit into what we're talking about here in your judgment? In my judgment, the way it's laid out, I think they're looking at practitioners. Meaning the ones that are administering. Yeah. People who are involved in the, the administration collecting cycle. Collecting the data and all of that. Correct. Okay. Well, I, I would, I would uh, think that maybe we want to seek a little more specificity. I certainly think uh, you and whoever else worked with you on this uh, have been very thorough, and I think the suggestion about large counties being represented aggressively is very important because frequently statewide, as we know, um, the large counties get lost as they do in all the organizations and, and all of the... Uh, uh, other kinds of things that encompass uh, education in general because although we serve so many kids, there's not that many of us as organizations. So I would just ask us to be a little more specific in our urging to find out how big is it going to be and see if we can make that a little more useful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. 
Other questions for Mr. Brown, Dr. Brown? Yes. Uh, Ms. Miller? Oh, hi, Dr. Brown. Hi. Um, I couldn't find it just now looking for it, but I understand that there was information in the report that um, the local assessments actually take up the majority of the assessment time rather than the state and federal. Do you have uh, numbers on that? So th there's actually a table in, in the document that I think um, is useful to, to look at um, because one of the first, if you look at one of the first charges and first findings of, of, the, of the commission was looking at how assessments are used. And again, we've had these, this group of principals in place to guide our work for, for a minute. So it's not surprising that we actually have one of these smallest mandated assessment footprints in the state. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's only one system out there, and it's a small one, that has a smaller footprint in terms of mandated assessment. So we've been very intentional. Our mandated assessments are limited to MAP, PSAT, and SAT. The, the remainder are the state assessments. We have no other mandated uh, large-scale uh, norm reference assessments in the system. Okay, so this only dealt with mandated. Yeah. Okay. Um, and do you have any just rough figures on what percentage is the local versus state? Uh, for our system? Yeah. Not off the top of my head. I, but that, I don't. you're saying it's but, in there. I didn't see but it. But again, anywhere. what I would get at is that we have an incredibly small assessment footprint and an intentionally small assessment footprint. Um, I was surprised that the report didn't, or the commission didn't seem to deal with the issue of parental opt out of assessments. Do you have any feedback on why that wasn't addressed in this? Actually, the report addresses the need to have a 95% participation rate in assessment. Right. And I think that that comes up in a couple different places in the document. Um, it's really important when you're trying to make apples to apples comparisons uh, between LEAs or if you're, as I've heard you many times, be very interested in being able to have hard data to make decisions around uh, programmatic things. It's important to have a representative sample. And when you have opt-out, then you don't have a representative sampling of students to participate and make those types of inferences. And so, yeah, actually the, the report addresses that and says that 95% is, is expected. Well, only if 100% opted out. I mean, you would have a sampling if you had 5% participation, but. Uh, not but, a representative sampling, and that's the issue. <coughs> okay. Um, so you don't have any information on why they didn't touch that, because that's been a big issue statewide, nationally, locally? Yes. Um, so I was a little um, surprised by that. But again, uh, as you've stated a number of times, it's incredibly important to, to have data to make decisions about uh, the efficacy of programming, uh, curriculum efficacy, et cetera. And the only way one can do that is through representative sampling. <coughs> one has to have a representative sample. And this is why there's been this push to have a representation of the students. When you have less than 95%, there is the possibility of skewing in the data. Well, 95% is more than a representation. It's almost the, it's not even hardly a sample because it's almost the whole population. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, I mean, perhaps the reason they didn't address it was because um, I'm not I believe speculate the why, yeah, they didn't. MSDE's position has been that it's a local issue to, to address parental opt-out. Although I don't think they have that anywhere in policy, but I think that's how that they've addressed it to parents. Uh, federal and state accountability, the expectation is 95% participation, and I have not seen anything in language that would suggest otherwise from the state. In order to qualify for funding. I would that, also probably say this is beyond the scope of the recommendations we're putting forward to the board for the assessment commission. This right. is beyond that scope. Okay. Ms. Causey. Hi, thank you. Sure. Uh, that was a, a very um, helpful explanation. Um, on the first item one, I am uh, curious what teacher input was um, taken into consideration 
And uh, what was TABCO's input on that recommendation? 3.1. Uh, no, number, yes, number one in recommendation 3.1. I, I did not seek TAPCO's input on that, that recommendation. So, again, um, the literature would suggest that students do better when they are tested by their teachers. Assessment is a part of the overall instructional practice. And particularly when you think about your most vulnerable students, those who have the right to receive accommodations, those accommodations should be provided during instruction. Um, I think it's unreasonable to think that we could, and again, if you read the language on this, unreasonable to think that we could arbitrarily pick people to fill those roles with no controls over their training. Um, it, it's a lot to expect. Okay, thank you. And then the next uh, question I had related to um, Senator Collins' question, um, it's uh, item number two and in recommendation 4.2, the commission proposes to establish a practitioner stakeholder advisory group. Um, how many local accountability coordinators do we have in BCPS? One. One, okay. So for the large districts, it wouldn't be um, that unwieldy for MSDE to accept this recommendation. Um, now, you're, and you're also stating that we would recommend that the local accountability coordinator be specifically named as one of the core practitioners to participate in this group. So you're not asking for principals and teachers to be uh, substituted by the LAC, but you're asking in addition to include the LAC. Absolutely. So principals and teachers from BCPS would still be available to be in this uh, stakeholder group. Uh, I th that's, that sounds very good. Um, and the next thing, um, item number 2B in recommendation 5.1, um, you have in there that uh, you support reporting the time students spend in mandated assessment, but would recommend that LEAs not disaggregate the time for EL and students with exceptional needs. <coughs> and um, I would have to say that I disagree with that, and I... Um, hope that um, other board members would consider removing that because just as you had mentioned that we do have our um, special populations that we do need to measure accurately um, that we do need um, to understand not just from a small group but from the whole population um, and I and I think it's maybe a stretch to assume that MSDE would use this information to to limit our IEPs or other accommodations that we have um, for our students. I think that it would be important to know trends in the testing time for our students and also to see if in fact that they're, with this extra time, how much improvement are they able to make. And then that would, uh, that measurement would allow for better planning, maybe better for planning for IEPs and for testing accommodations, um, and especially in light of the new grading procedures that will allow for retesting. Um, I think it's important that we really understand how much time um, everyone is spending, but especially our, our special populations, um, that we should definitely have that. And I would, uh, I'll, I'll be making a motion to that, um, but I hope the other board members would support me in that. The last thing that I had um, a comment and a question about is um, I really do appreciate the extensions that you've recommended in 7.1 and 7.2. Um, there was, it was interesting that uh, Park was saying for a, a couple months that there was no mode effect and then they finally, uh, the research showed that there was a mode effect. Um, and I would just ask about um, adding uh, that the MSDE analyze the mode effect and determine that if there are segments of the test where paper is the best method for the student to show what they know, that we would consider asking Park to modify the test. Um, for instance, in our advanced placement tests uh, with the, uh, some of the brightest, hardest working kids, they have the opportunity in free response questions to write answers uh, that get graded because that has been determined to be the best way to show that knowledge, their mastery of that content. Um, so I don't know if anyone has had thought about that, um, but um, I might make a separate motion to maybe suggest that to the MSDE. But I'll wait and see if any other board members have any questions. Are there any, if there are no other questions, I would uh, ask if we could uh, vote on the, a motion to accept the recommendation. To, yes, go ahead. I'd like to amend the motion. 
I have, we haven't made one yet. Okay. <laughs> um, I would uh, ask for a motion to approve the recommendations to the State Board, uh, to the Maryland State Board of Education on the final report of the Commission to review Maryland's use of assessments and testing in public schools. I'll second. make that motion. Okay, it's been moved and second. Is there, yes, Ms. Causey? I'd like to amend the motion uh, and ask that the board remove uh, item 2B, which recommends that we do not at disaggregate by grade and service, uh, which includes English learners and students with disabilities. All right. There's an amendment. Is there a second to the amendment? I second. Second. Is there any discussion about the amendment? All those in favor of uh, the amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Okay, the most, abstain. Any abstain, one abstention. So the amendment does not carry. And uh, Mr. Yulfeld has abstained. All right. Ms. Quasi? Um, I would like to amend the motion. Um, I would like to request that MSDE analyze the mode effect and determine if paper is the best method for some aspects of the test, uh, that they would uh, consider modifying the park test so that our students can show what they know. I second that. All right. Um, is there any discussion? To yes. I'd like to suggest that we vote on the recommendations that were presented by Dr. Brown and then perhaps consider Ms. Causey's uh, suggestion as an addition to that. Do you have an issue with that? Well, we, are, we already have a motion that's seconded. Mm -hmm. So that would mean that I would recommend that you everyone vote against Ms. Causey's motion so that we can then vote on Dr. Brown's suggestions and then we can entertain a, a duplicate motion by Ms. Causey. I don't see how it could be an addition if really we're modifying it. I mean, we want to eliminate 2B, so we can't have it as an addition. We've our, I think we voted on that. Yeah, on that, voted on that. I've moved on to item three. It's in, it's right here, recommendations like regarding 7.1 oh, and 7.2 oh, okay. to add a recommendation. No. I'm sorry, okay. All right. So um, then if there's no, yes, Mr. Well, I'm just saying, let's do it the way it works. Okay. I mean, what's the best way to make this thing work? Well, let, let's. Procedurally, mechanically. Um, I, th I have a motion that's seconded. I. But I mean, is what what Ed's, what Ed's said to work to work from this uh, from the executive sum uh, from the executive summary language and, and modify this executive summary language isn't, isn't that what Ed is suggesting? I, I suggested the vote against Ms. Causey's motion so that we can uh, now vote up or down Dr. the suggestions made by Dr. Brown and then. If Ms. Causey wishes to add something that would be ad in addition to this, it would be a separate right. discussion. Right. Mr. Right. Chair, right. I'll, I'll withdraw yes. my motion in order to uh, reverse. Okay. Proceed. All right. To proceed. Okay. As Mr. Gillis suggests. Thank you. All right. So then I would ask again. Um, we had the original motion on the floor. All in favor? Would you please raise your hand? I'll be accepting. All right. That motion carries unanimously. And now we will vote on this. Make your motion, make your motion again. Um, I would like to make a motion that the Board of Education request of the Maryland State Department of Education to, in extension of recommendation 7.1 and 7.2, to analyze the mode effect and determine that if paper is the best method for our students to show what they know, that they would consider uh, modifying the park test um, in order for our students to be able to um, best show their knowledge of the content. And it was second. All right, so moved and second. Is there any discussion at, at this time? If not, all in favor, please raise your hand. 
That motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. Ka Kathleen, are you going to suggest, uh, you suggested uh, something on 4.2? Uh, no, that, that I did. I, that I had commented on. Did you want to incorporate yours into, I was just going to suggest that we, uh, um, <clears throat> that we tighten up the language so to more accurately f reflect what Dr. Brown said. Uh, that, you know, we, we think that, uh, um, that we're not suggesting that every single L, uh, local accountability coordinator, you know, like, you know, we don't know how many people are even on this committee, but that there be, you know, a representative, uh, Dr. Brown, how could we word that better? Well, per I, I Pursuant to what you had said before, to follow up on, I mean, in answer to my question, assuming, I mean, help me word it the way uh, that is, would reflect what you said, uh, so, Mr. Collins, I, I think you and I um, both struggle with the ambiguity yeah, of the language. Exactly. And so the recommendation was that um, given the ambiguity of the language, that we at least name the local accountability coordinator for large systems okay. as a representative role in that committee. Well, could we change the language then to say, say it that way? Because that's not how we say it here. In, in, your, in, our, in, in, in our recommendation, too, we don't say it that way. So could we modify it to say it that way? I mean, we can do what we want if we have the votes, but is that, a, I, I believe that's a better way to say it. So, so I would recommend that we say it For that point way. point of order, we already had a vote, and we voted on it the other way, so I'm confused where we are, just procedurally. Well, we're doing the same thing we did with, we accepted all of it, and then, then we but modified it. was an it. addition, not a, not a change from what we approved. Well, do you know what I'm saying? I do. Okay. Yeah, I do. I do understand what you're saying, but uh, I'm still going to uh, going to proceed here <clears throat> and not worry about that particular technicality. Would you? Are you going to make a motion then, right. Mr. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. I, 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 Mike, I, I, this this is a modification. I don't know that you'd modify it with this exact language. You might want to expand this modification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, be a little we clearer, could, we, but yeah, I, that's, I don't that's, think that's, all I'm, that's all I'm trying to do. Okay, well, yeah. I think well, we could Brown. direct Dr. Brown to, yeah. you know, do right. well, without, without us without voting, voting on it. That's that, what I'm trying to say. Just well, be a little fine. more explanatory. I, I certainly don't care if it gets in the modification on. of 4.2. <laughs> <that's laughs> yeah, Dr. Brown, you got, you got it. Good. Uh, Dr. Yeah, Brown, you have it. Will you convey it to these folks? Yes, more than happy. Okay. Very good. Okay. That's, Great. that's all Thank I was you. wanting. That's all we want to do. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I would just request that the board get the, um, be copied on the final version that's sent to MSDE. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Yep. I'm sure Dr. Brown will accommodate that. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you. Uh, our next agenda item is new business, the observing of Eid holidays. And uh, for that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Williams. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, as chair of PRC, at this, op at this time, it is um, being recommended by the Policy Review Committee <clears throat> that the full board vote on whether or not it will um, be closing Baltimore County Public Schools for the two High Holy Muslim Days of Eid al adha and Eid al-Fitr. And that is what is before us at this time. All right. So uh, are you, you're making, that's a motion to the board, correct, from PRC? That's our recommendation, so yes, it is a motion. All right. So since that uh, is coming from committee, we don't need a second. At this time, I'd like to ask if there's any discussion around the motion that's been presented. Uh, Ms. Miller. Yes. Um, this issue is not simple to resolve. There are several legal uh, requirements to satisfy as well as practical considerations as well. So I applaud the efforts of the PRC. However, I don't believe that the policy before us is uh, sufficient. Um, in order to establish an objective, fair, and equitable policy, it has to meet the following requirements. It has to comply with state and local law, which require a non-secular reason for closing schools, the policy really needs to set a threshold which would be used to trigger closure. 
and the board must have data to justify the meeting of the threshold. Um, if we pass this policy as it's currently written, I don't believe that we are fully addressing this issue. Um, we'll be dealing with it again with the next religious group, just as we did with the Muslim community. Um, you know, they're asserting that we acted inequitably by allowing the Jewish holidays without proper justification, but then not theirs. Um, next time it around, it'll be the Hindus or Buddhists will assert the same thing with regard to the Muslim holidays. Um, so I think we really need to be clear on what's going to trigger the closure and what data then supports the non-secular purpose. Um, so as secular. I'm sorry, yes. secular purpose. Excuse me. Can I respond? Well, as soon as I'm done. Um, so as it's proposed, I don't believe that it meets the requirements of the law. And uh, you know, I support this measure. I think we all do, but we got to get it right. Um, if this policy doesn't pass tonight, I, um, I urge the board to pass a motion to send it back to the PRC to continue working on it. And you know, obviously this issue is not going away, as we can see. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, PRC has addressed this issue. We've addressed this issue since uh, 2015. We've had several public hearings. And quite frankly, um, we believe that um, we have as much anecdotal evidence that um, it's inequitable for, you know, the uh, Muslim children to have to decide as to whether or not they should go to school or stay home to observe their holiday, as we do for why Baltimore County Public Schools has chosen to um, close school for other uh, religious holidays. Mm -hmm. And um, while it certainly would be perhaps ideal if the board um, wanted to set a threshold percentage as to, you know, the number of students or the population that would be affected, like 10 percent, which, you know, the motion could be modified to, to, to say that. But at this point, the motion before the board, which we do not believe um, uh, is an illegal motion, and we, we believe that um, it's based on equity. And it's, it's based on whether or not it's equitable for a large population um, to have to decide, stay home or, or observe, you know, their uh, religious holidays or go to school, rather. I mean, absolutely. And I don't think we need to, you know, argue the equity issue. I think we all agree on that. It is um, resolving yeah, sure. it in a way where it's not going to come back to us later. We've got to resolve well, <clears throat> it um, in a very clear manner with thresholds, with data. Well, I think it's unfair to, because actually what you're saying is in order for this board to reach a decision that it should somehow punish this community by making them stay home so that we have statistics to show when in fact from all of the anecdotal information that we've been provided, um, the, the hearings, the, the various um, attendance um, at our various meetings, um, PRC believes that there is a legitimate um, reason to, to proceed tonight. There are other PRC members um, who are present, and if either of you have anything to say, um, this is your opportunity to do so. I would ask a point of clarification. The motion. Uh, is proposing to close schools. Um, are you proposing schools and offices or um, just the schools themselves? However, BCPS handles any other holiday. So does that? That's the answer. And other holidays, I believe, schools and offices are closed. Then that's your answer. All right. Mr. Collins. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, of the board, uh, I was the one that gave this task with the vote of the board approving, of course, to the PRC uh, almost two years ago. And they've done a magnificent job of studying it and dealing with it. Now I think uh, <coughs> Member 
uh, Ann Miller makes some excellent points in her comments. However, if we consider them to be defining of our decision, I think we're making an error. First of all, whenever anything is passed in any kind of a body, legislative or in this case uh, a board of education, the argument is always this is going to be the camel's nose under the tent and all kinds of things will happen. Well, and if we adhere to that, nothing will ever happen. The second part is virtually no law or regulation is perfect. Sometimes perfect is the enemy of good. I've had a long life, a privileged life of public service, and I was privileged to be in the House of Delegates about 35 years ago when we were debating whether to support the concept of Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday being a national holiday. And just 35 or so years ago, it took the Maryland House of Delegates three separate votes and several legislative maneuverings to finally come up with the 71 votes necessary to pass that support for recognizing the uh, holiday of Dr. Martin Luther King. Sometimes you have to seize the moment. For us in Baltimore County, after all the work of the PRC, this is that moment. It's time to do the right thing Set aside your ambivalence. Will there be a lawsuit? Will there be other groups coming before us? Will there be this? Will there be that? Set aside your uncertainty and just recognize the realities of Baltimore County, of Maryland, of the United States of America, and indeed the world with respect to the voice we will announce tonight. We will say something powerful and something correct, we will clearly do the right thing in 2016, and we should support this. I will rem <laughs> remind you almost superfluously, when New York passed this, they indicated, now I read this in a New York Times article, they said that as far as an effect on the educational program, because of the way these holidays float uh, on the calendar, that in the next 20 years, it would only affect eight school days to begin with. So we're, n we're not talking about dramatic things happening. We're not talking about many, many children being out of school too long or school going on until the 4th of July. Let's just stop and think about the nature of the issue the nature of our world and the powerful statement for fairness, for justice that we can make tonight. I hope you will support this. Thank you. Ms. Pratt. Thank you. Um, I just want to echo some of the thoughts that Anne shared. Um, I believe what was important of what she about what she had talked about was that this could be a band-aid solution. As one of our speaker said tonight, history repeats itself. 20 years ago, we voted on Jewish holidays, and now here we are voting on Muslim holidays. So the question of will this be an issue before the board, I think is evident. Demographics are always shifting, so I don't want, I think the important thing is that we look long term and we ensure that we take this opportunity to really look ahead and see what we can do, not just for the Muslim community, but for all communities that will be affected by passing a policy like this. So I do think it's important that we do as a county make a measurement, maybe not, um, I'm not sure how this would happen, whether through a survey like Howard County, but ensuring that we can make sure that all groups are going to have the same opportunity you are getting tonight. So thank, thank you. you. Uh, Mr. Gillis. Yeah, this is the lawyer speaking. I, I, I listened to Ms. Miller, Ms. Bratt, um, uh, Ms. Williams, and I, I really think this is a legal issue, and if it's okay, I'd like to ask our legal counsel to give uh, his opinion about the issue that's before us. Uh, all right, Mr. Mr. Nuston. Um, 
So this is a legal issue, and specifically it's a constitutional issue. And the question that, that has to be resolved is whether the board's action in closing schools on a particular a religious holiday would violate the Establishment Clause of the United States Constitution, which is the, the provision in the Constitution that generally requires a separation of church and state. The Maryland State Board of Education, in a case decided uh, from this county, from Baltimore County Board of Education in 2005, held specifically, and I'm quoting here, it would be illegal for a local school system to close schools for the purpose of recognizing a religious holiday of one particular faith, end quote. This is from a state board decision that quoted or cited to a number of uh, two different uh, court of appeals cases. The school board, the state board of education noted, and here I'm quoting again, that the school system must have some secular purpose for designating school holidays such as economizing educational resources on days with high absenteeism for both students and teachers. That language in turn comes from a decision that was rendered by the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, which covers Maryland. It was decided in 1999 uh, in reference to a challenge to a Maryland law that requires that schools be closed on Good Friday and the Monday after Easter Sunday. The court there up did uphold that Maryland law requiring those school uh, holidays finding that the closing was necessary because of the high rate of expected absenteeism on those days among students and teachers. And the court went on to conclude that the closure on those days was supported by contemporary, pragmatic, and a secular purpose. My concern here is whether there is a secular purpose uh, in closing schools for uh, specific religious holidays. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about equity and about equality and that sort of thing, which is, which is very important, obviously, and, and an essential component of what a Board of Education does. But for purposes of the, of the uh, uh, constitutional question of the Establishment Clause, equity, in my view, is not a secular purpose that would justify the closing of schools on a particular religious holiday. And I think what would be necessary is some sort of support uh, for the notion that there is an expected uh, high rate of absenteeism among students and staff that would justify uh, the closing of schools for a religious holiday. I think there is. A, a question, uh, if this matter were to be litigated, I think there is a question about whether, whether a court uh, would, uh, would uphold the board's action, again, based on the Establishment Clause of the Constitution. And the anecdotal information and evidence that we have, we believe that provides uh, the, the non-secular uh, reason um, that is necessary given uh, the issue of equity based upon the um, extensive testimony that we have received. Thank you. The other, uh, hey. Ms. Johnson, I think Ms. Johnson, had, yes. Um, so just tonight, we have, you, I don't even think you're here, Ms. Williams, we have been asked to look at two or three other policies on the PRC. So if we pass, and hopefully we pass this policy tonight, as a board and as a PRC, we can revisit the policy. Um, this is not set in stone for now until eternity. If there's flaws in it, if in 10 years from now we have to revisit it because of another growing population, whatever religious or not, we can revisit this policy. We've talked about equity, I think, just in this meeting 20-some times tonight. As a board, as a community, as, a, as BCPS, as a, as, a, as a mother and a, and a parent here in, in Baltimore County, I talk about equity all the time, not just in this realm, but in, in, in different parts of my life. And if it's time that we don't just talk about it, but we be about it. And this vote will show that we are more than just lip service, giving lip service to the word equity, that we truly believe that with the data provided, with the anecdotal information, with the fact that we still have the, the Jewish holidays on the calendar without any real data for those, we are truly being equitable to all of our students in Baltimore County. Thank you. Ms. Kazi and then uh, Ms. Ms. Kazi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, I would like to um, really applaud the efforts of the Policy Review Committee. Um, I am on it, but I was not on it when uh, they first began this work among all of the work that they do on the policies for the school system. Uh, but in the work that I was involved in, we did in fact uh, discuss the secular reason that the schools are closed for the Jewish holidays and the secular reason that it would be reasonable to close the schools on the Muslim holidays. And that has to do with the economics of providing a fair and effective and an equitable education. Um, it was anecdotal that 20 years ago that on the Jewish holidays there was going to be an economic disadvantage 
to the school system by hiring substitute teachers for all of those that would be absent on those holidays. Um, at the same time, there will be economic and a lack of effective education if we force a community to have all of their students be absent in order for them to observe their holiday. And I think that, so we're talking about uh, the students being absent doesn't necessarily add the cost of a substitute teacher, but it does impair the teacher's ability to provide the same fair and effective education on a daily basis if there will be potentially 500, 1,000, 2,000, we don't know because it's not appropriate for us to poll our community as to their religious affiliation. But if in fact there are a substantial number of absentees on one day, and there are only a few days in which those students can make up all the work, that it does impair the ability of our teachers to effectively teach each child. So that would be the secular reason uh, to do that. And I think in terms of, um, how do we get it right we, without um, being intrusive in terms of the actual numbers um, to simply say that the board will determine if there is a substantial population whose absentees, whether it's teachers or students, on a day would make it reasonable to close the schools in order to economize how we provide education. That was discussed, and honestly, I'm a little bit disappointed because there was a document that was drafted that should have been attached for all of the board members, and it should have been on board docs for everyone to see. So I don't know where that document was, but we have uh, discussed that aspect of it. And if there's um, a motion, maybe uh, someone, maybe uh, we can amend what Miss Williams said. Um, uh, Mr. Burke had his hand up. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in light of uh, Council's comments at the request of Mr. Gillis, I did not hear any suggestion from Mr. Gillis that the motion be amended to eliminate any existing religious holidays approved by this board. Putting that off to the side then, let's face the secular issue because let's just all assume this is all about secularism. The secular issue before us is whether, in the absence of proving this motion, there will be a wasteful expenditure of precious and limited educational financial resources due to unoccupied seats of students who had to make the most difficult decision to observe their faith and not be present in a BCPS classroom with the lights on, with a teacher or a substitute there with buses that are running, with engines that are running, with gas that is being consumed. Now, I was not on the board. I had not yet been appointed when um, the PRC committee, which whose membership on I did not seek, uh, uh, <laughs> held its hearing uh, on this matter. I have discussed at some length and, um, and some depth with our chair, um, uh, Romaine Williams, who was present, who I know to be a very active listener, and in my discussions with her, she has indicated she believes the case has been made uh, that, in fact, this is a um, noteworthy community of students, and therefore, the secular issue is whether, as a board, we will look the other way when these students' seats are empty, knowing that there is a wasteful expenditure of limited, precious educational financial resources. That's the secular issue before the board. Because if the board's intent is to address a secular <coughs> issue, then, in my humble opinion, the constitutional matter raised by Mr. Nussbaum, whose judgment and scholarship I do respect, I believe is off the table because it is a secular decision the board is making for those for that most secular reason. That's what I would add. Thank you, Mr. Virch. I think Mr. Yule felt and then um, I, I, let me let me start off with a little history because I know most of you weren't around in 1993 or 1994. And it's unfortunate that the records prior to that time when the board then adopted closing on the Jewish holidays is not available today. 
But let me see if I can give you a little history, which I think if you go back into uh, the archives, you'll find to be true. Um, the reason was that for so many years uh, on the Jewish holidays, uh, the school, many of the schools where there was a heavy concentration of Jewish students uh, were virtually empty. Uh, I can attest to that because I lived across the street from Fort Garrison Elementary School and there were buses that would come with one child on it. And perhaps more costly than that was that at that time, it was an estimated uh, population of teachers um, who were Jewish anywhere from 15 to 25 percent. Now, I know that's in 1993. Uh, unfortunately, today, we cannot poll our teachers to determine uh, what, what religious holi holidays or what their faith is, but there is some data. And um, let, let me tell you what the data is, because this is factual data, and, and um, although it's not, it's not being talked about too much, and we did review this in policy review um, when I was a part of the committee and we issued the report. And I must say, we worked about seven months, and we had public hearings, and there wasn't any data that was presented uh, that showed that in any way, shape, or form uh, that there was a secular purpose for closing on the Muslim holidays. But for all of you that don't know, um, in a lot of quarters, uh, the holiday of Rosh Hashanah is celebrated two days. Our records show that on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, we had over 230 teachers who took religious holiday. Now, that means that those teachers had to have a substitute. And assuming they all got substitutes at a hundred and some dollars a day, the second day, which is not uh, fully observed by most Jews, um, cost us over 23 or $25,000. Now, that's not a lot of money considering the budget. I understand that. But if, if you take the first day, I can assure you that all teachers who observe the Jewish faith will not be there. Now, how many are there? I don't know. But if you had 230-some on the second day, I assure you you'll be in the thousands on the first day. Now the question is, if you have 1,000 or 1,500 or 2,000 teachers uh, who take holiday, take a religious holiday that day, what is the cost to the system? Uh, I suspect that the cost will be very large. Um, there, is a, there is a significant drop in student attendance on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, and I'm sure in the first day there would be a, an enormous drop. So there are reasons why uh, in 93 or 94 uh, the board chose to close. And I, I would tell you that I don't know and I don't have any factual, but it would seem to me to be um, acceptable to understand that the Jewish population in Baltimore County has not dropped significantly, if at all. In fact, it's probably increased since 1993 or 1994. And again, I can't address the number of teachers who are the Jewish faith. But there is a secular reason for closing for the Jewish holidays. My question perhaps is one a little odd. Uh, maybe we ought to revisit closing on the Jewish holidays to make sure that we have enough data for a secular reason. And then that puts this issue of equality uh, on the back burner. Right. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Miller, and then I'll get to Ms. Williams. Um, a couple of problems. One is I've not, I, I don't believe any kind of data or, or even anecdotal data has been presented to the board by PRC. Now, we've had a lot of people come and testify, and we know there's a lot of support for this, and they're not going to go away. We know that. We just got to get it right. And the secular reason that's being stated is being stated as an if-then statement. If there's a Muslim holiday and a lot of people are absent, then we'll know we'll have data. But the problem is we that hasn't we we haven't measured that yet. Not only 
have we not measured the absence, the absenteeism, but we haven't set a definition for what too much absenteeism is. So we haven't done our job here. We have, we, the board, and prior boards obviously then haven't done their job either because I um, agree. There, there, there was just anecdotal evidence back then, and there's still ev anecdotal uh, evidence today. That's my point. And PRC did present that information um, in 2015. This is an issue that's gone on for two years, in fact. And you know, to bring up what happened. 20 some years ago. We're in 2016 now, and the demographics have changed. And I think that, um, you know, th again, the mere and sheer presence and, and volume and the various uh, persons who have come before this board and testified, children and parents, uh, uh, the significant impact um, is, is the same anecdotal evidence that boards in prior years have had. Um, you know, if my suggestion is we vote tonight and the vote will be what the vote will be. Um, if, in fact, you know, we need to revisit this later, then we can do that. But I think that a decision, you have enough information to make a decision tonight. We can't revisit it. If we go ahead and No, I'm talking about if if no, just one at a time. If other, if other religious groups come to us, then perhaps we'll have to deal right. with that down the road. But that's not before us tonight. Right. But if we just go ahead and vote on it. <laughs> if we go ahead without having to find our threshold and having data <clears throat> and we pass it, we can't unpass it later when we find out, you know, that was really a minuscule percentage of the population or it doesn't meet the threshold. You can unpass that we've anything defined. with the vote. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Virch, did you, you had another comment? Uh, first, I just want to um, thank David for his retrospective and uh, also his um, um, willingness to reconsider what has uh, sort of been also very much in the same discussion. Uh, and I, I think that speaks very well of David. Um, I had the occasion to speak with uh, doc, one of Dr. Dance's predecessors, and that was the superintendent, uh, who was superintendent at the time that uh, the earlier religious date was, uh, dates were approved by uh, the membership of this board. And I asked a very direct question of the superintendent at that time based on his uh, recollection and without hesitating, the question that I asked was uh, what, if any, quantification was provided with regard to the secular basis for, the, for, the, for those prior approved religious holidays? Without any hesitation, um, uh, the previous superintendent, uh, Dr. Stuart Berger, uh, in um, April of this year said to me, there was none. So um, his recollection uh, counterposed with uh, David's. Uh, members of the board can exercise their own judgment in sorting that out. Uh, I have the 2016 uh, gut judgment of the chair of really, I think, one of the hardest working committees, again, a committee I did not ask to be on, uh, and her judgment I'm willing to go with. And um, I've laid out, you know, what I believe to be the secular intent and um, the secular basis as described by uh, the chair of the PRC. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gillis. Yeah, so um, I want to take this opportunity publicly to um, express my respect for Mr. Jamil, Dr. Farone, the entire Baltimore County Muslim community. You have been great advocates. You will continue to be great advocates of principles as important as equity and equality. And I just want to express that publicly here. Um, I also want to commend this board for just very recently um, addressing the fall Eid holiday by having scheduled now and going forward professional development days. So there are no empty seats on the fall Eid holiday because schools will be closed for 
uh, all students um, so that uh, our students of Muslim faith will be able to um, express their religious faith in the ways that they deem appropriate not being at school. Um, those, those things being said, um, I am still, I fall on the side of uh, Mr. Nussbaum's uh, conclusion that uh, we don't have any secular articulable basis to close schools uh, because closing schools has a court-imposed standard um, that has been uh, stated by him. So again, I, I, I express my love and respect for this very active community, um, and I think that, uh, that this board has done commendable things in uh, establishing professional development days so schools can be closed for students on the fall Eid holiday. Uh, Mr. Collins, and I think we are close to uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to just uh, address briefly the concern expressed by <clears throat> uh, Council Nussbaum to the board and by Vice Chairman Gillis about court imposed this or that. Look at the sweep of history, if you will, for a moment. If we were bound by a court decision rendered in 1999 or whatever the date was that um, Mr. Nussbaum quoted, or if we were bound by a court decision, I believe it was in 1893 or in the 1850s, in the 1850s, Chief Justice Roger B. Tawney wrote the decision that declared slavery legal. And just this very day, as I was driving to this meeting, I heard on the radio, WBAL News, that the Frederick County Council is in the process of removing a statue of Justice Tawney from the courthouse of Frederick County because of that decision and we're in 2016. I'm not getting into whether that's a good idea or not. Now, in 1893, in Plessy v. Ferguson, the court said separate but equal was fine for education for black students in our country. Later on, of course, we know that the Warren Court in the famous Brown versus the Board of Education changed that decision. I would tell you right now that the composition of the Fourth Circuit Court of, of the United States of America, which meets in Richmond, is totally different from the justices who were sitting at the time that they made any decision relative to this issue back in, the, in, in 1990, whatever it was. And times frequently dictate the decisions the courts make. And if there ever was time for something to happen, this is the time. And we should move forward as Chairman Williams has suggested and very forcefully advocated. And all of these other arguments, with all due respect to my colleagues, are simply straw people that you're putting up um, to justify a, a vote that is not justifiable. Thank you. Uh, okay. I, I would just like to make a comment because this is a very important and very sensitive issue and I think that uh, it's only fair that I express my opinion also. I um, wholeheartedly supported the recommendation a couple months ago of the PRC to uh, schedule when possible a professional day to allow the Muslim students to be with their families and uh, celebrate their holidays uh, without penalty of missing school as they had. And um, I um, have a concern though uh, with the, the um, criticism that was expressed about how holidays were allotted for others religious uh, groups, as Mrs. Bratt, Ms. Bratt just said, that we're following down the same path. I have a concern that we are not able to equitably follow the same type of approach with other faiths that we have. And um, from an equity basis, I have a concern about um, uh, 
allowing a religious holiday without a secular purpose. Um, I, uh, I struggle over this very much personally because of the respect that I have for all the people that have come to board meetings. I have very much respect for all people of faith and want to support uh, the practice of their own beliefs and their religion. But I think about the other faiths that are in Baltimore County also, and if we follow this path, are we going to be able to do it equitably for all our constituents? And without the secular reason that we have in our laws, I think we would uh, be uh, uh, making a, uh, another mistake, which we may have uh, done years ago. But that's just my personal I, perspective. I, I just want to, again, um, and, I, and I just wanted, Ms. Eaton has had her hand up. Oh, I just I'm wanted sorry. to, and then I'll let you okay. uh, respond. So, uh, Ms. Eaton. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ferone asked board members to state um, the reason why they're going to vote for or against it. So respectfully, I'm going to vote no because I don't believe any religious holidays should be on the school calendar. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Williams. Um, you know, this, the secular reason is the equitable uh, academic well-being of the Muslim community, which has been shared through various stories and data reference points as to the population that we are um, considering closing schools for tonight. And having said that, I would call for the vote. Thank you. And I think we are, I think most board members have had their opportunity to uh, express their opinion. Um, and I would ask at this time if Ms. Decker would uh, call for the vote on the uh, motion that's been presented. Okay, Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Ms. Eaton? No. Mr. Gillis? No. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Miller? No. Mr. Stewart is absent. No. Mr. Birch? Aye. Ms. Williams? Yes. Ms. Bratt? No. Mr. McDaniels? No. Yes. Yes. So the motion doesn't pass at this time. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that the board directs the PRC to revisit the issue. I'm sorry, would you say that again? That's why it happened. Mr. Chairman, I move that the board directs the PRC to revisit the issue of the Muslim holiday, or not even Muslim, I'm sorry, revisit the issue of religious holidays on the calendar. Please. Second. Please. Religious Not. holiday by any name is a religious holiday. Please. You can give any label that you want. Our, our, with all my respect, with all my respect, I, I prefer her name who we give. Excuse me, sir, sir, you're, you're out of order. Respect, you're out of order right now. We're, we're, we're. To take the Jewish holiday out of the calendar. Yeah, they should be out. It should be out. No, no doubt about it. No it's Christmas. Religious. No, no, no Christmas. No Christmas. No Christmas. No Christmas. Nothing. I don't know why you can you, differentiate you, Christmas. Yes. No Christmas. No Christmas. Like Christmas. Oh, no. Come back. We're going to go holiday. to the next slide. We'll come back to that. Oh, okay. All day. So blind people are reading the board of education. So biased. What, what that does is it's the religious. So biased people without knowledge just just hating the people. Are you promoting the unity of, in the country or you are dividing them? Are you We're going to take a five minute recess until we clear the room so we can proceed. You are leaning on our children? Hmm? Shame the bias because. And I'm telling you, no Hindu, no Jewish, and uh, no Sikh will come here. If you are coming for 20 years, and show me one, one meeting with a Jewish uh, Hindu came or Sikh came. Nobody going to come. It is kind of like a we apologize for this outburst, and we're very thankful for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Thank you all those who voted for it. She appreciated it. We all have to live with our own conscience. God doesn't speak. God shall judge each one of us.
about what is substantial, about what is incremental, about what is negligible. This was a substantial secular reason. And then what? The fact that the academic well-being of the Muslim community is the, was the secular reason. That's not a secular reason. Sure it is. No, it isn't. Secular reason, secular reason has been defined as either economics well, or disruption. Well, and wait a minute, we, and we did have data on, on the Muslim holidays. We had no law, no, no in recent the Jewish holidays. Then you have no, you have no. Did you read what happened right. in Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. And then, 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 then it we continue our meeting now with um, our next agenda item, uh, contract awards, and I'll turn it over Mr. to Mr. Chairman, Gillis. there was a motion on the floor that was seconded. All right. Would you, uh, I agree, just say it out. Ladies and gentlemen, let's, let's uh, get to order. We, um, we, we don't have a quorum. Not a quorum anymore. Kathleen second your motion, right? Okay. Let's wait till she returns. We have seven. All right. Um, would you repeat your motion again? The motion was to um, let the board to waste direct the, the PRC to revisit the issue of religious holidays on the calendar. All right, uh, that motion has been seconded. Um, is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. I, I like clarification, excuse okay. me. What, revisit it for what purpose? I'd like direction. On what purpose are we revisiting it for? <clears throat> to settle the issue of religious holidays, to define what our secular purpose is, the threshold for meeting it, and what data we have. We're not revisiting that on the Muslim because that's what we've provided. It's anecdotal, and that's what we have. So to say revisit what we've revisited is silly. Um, if the if the directive is for PRC to visit the issue of all re religious holidays, yes. then I think that's an appropriate motion. That was the motion oh, to okay. to revisit the issue of. Religious holidays I on you the said school the calendar. Muslim holidays. Religious. Okay. All right. Um, again, that you're you're good. That was a discussion. I'm, that's fine. All right. It's moved and second. All in favor of directing PRC to revisit all religious holidays, please raise your hand. That's unanimous. Okay, the motion carries. All right. Um, yeah, mo motion carries with yeah. the votes here. All right, we'll move on to our next agenda item, which is contract awards and Mr. Gillis. Building the contracts met earlier today, uh, considered the four contracts that are listed as K1 through 4, and we recommend to this board that they all approve K1 through 4. All right, do I have a motion? Oh, you, no, no. you have made a motion to approve K1 through 4. We don't need a second. Is there any discussion? Can we break it out? Yes, you may. If Number you, two. If you'd like to remove K2. All right. Uh, then I would ask all those in favor of K1, K3, and K4, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Okay. Uh, Ms. Miller on K2. Um, I had a few questions. Is I wasn't sure what this was and whether this was part of the community schools initiative. Uh, this is um, part of a uh, Maryland AWARE grant, uh, which is um, in, for this particular contract, we're talking about kinship care in which family members are 
providing uh, care for their students and uh, the Catholic Charities uh, provides a support service to them for accessing um, behavioral, mental health, um, and, and other state, county, and federal services that might be available to them in the process of providing uh, care for their student member, student family members. And so why is Baltimore County Public Schools getting involved in that? Uh, because it's uh, part of the grant application that we developed for this purpose. We received a, a five-year, $2.1 million, $2 million grant um, for, let's see, Multi-tiered systems of support uh, for social and emotional learning, behavioral health, uh, classroom management and behavior, um, and uh, youth, other youth behavioral health needs. And uh, Baltimore County government has a relationship contractually with Associated Catholic Charities um, for a similar purpose in navigating available public services. And uh, we are accessing that contract for the purpose of kinship care as it relates to this grant. And what educational purpose does this serve? So, George, you yeah, so, I'm going to. So, so, <laughs> I'm going to defer to the Spires, uh, I'm gonna experts ask, here. I'm going to ask um, our, our general counsel to jump in first before you do. Okay. Just briefly, Ms. Miller, if I may. Um, informal kinship care is established under the education article. What the legislature determined was that it was not fair to, parent to those who were parenting our students, like grandmothers or aunts or uncles, ancillary family, to have to go to court to get custody, formal custody, of students in order to enroll them in our schools. So if grandmom has stepped in and is taking care of a child, they are considered to have informal kinship care of the child. And as Mr. Saris has described, sometimes may need ancillary services in order to support uh, a child that they had not expected to be caring for. But informal kinship care is a reason for which both under state law as well as under our policy, students may be enrolled in our schools. Thank you. Um, so is this considered to be part of the community schools initiative? So this- Or not related at all? The navigation services are part of meeting an objective of the Maryland AWARE grant that we were awarded. And so the navigation services um, are going to assist families with navigating the various resources that are available to them through the community in order to access services for mental health. But to answer Ms. Mills' questions, it's not in connection to what you're referring back to that we did with Owens Mills High School, but it is available to all kids across our county. Okay, thank you. All right, if there are no further questions, uh, I'll ask for a vote on item K2. All those in favor of Approving item K2, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. All right. Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Dixit, did you have an update uh, on projects? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, good evening again. Good evening. Um, uh, you know, summertime, it's time for us to get the buildings ready, and it's the school opening time. I just want to provide you an update on all aspects of facilities. Building operations has been working diligently for last two months to get the building ready, and all of the buildings have gone through extensive summer cleaning and are ready to be occupied by students on the first day. Ground crew has completed all the grass mowing operations, and you'll see campus with nicely manicured uh, grounds, about more than 4,000 acres of that. Uh, the building maintenance group had identified 
several work orders that related to health, life, and safety before the school opening, and all of those work orders have been completed. On the construction side, uh, air conditioning installation at seven schools have been completed. Kearney, Chase, Hawthorne, Joppa View, Scotts Branch, Victory Villa, and Sudbrook Magnet will have air conditioning on the school opening day. There is one school that we had hoped for that we are a couple of weeks behind this Halstead Academy, and that's going to be completed by September 9th. The delay was caused by the delay in receiving equipment. On the construction side, the major projects at Catonsville Elementary, Westtown Elementary, and uh, Westchester Edition, they are all completed as we promised. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the board for approving acceleration amount some months ago, and that has helped us in completing the projects on time. The other two schools on the southwest side, Relay Elementary um, is and the Lansdowne, they are in design stage, and they'll be ready for occupancy next year in August 2018. In the northeast area, uh, the Victory Villa project, which has several pieces to it, uh, renovation of existing Rosedale facilities to accommodate students from Victory Villa, that work is completed. The new facility, the leased facility at Golden Ring, has been refurbished to accept the Rosedale program, and Victory Villa has been moved to Rosedale, or will be moved on the opening day. And the Rosedale program will be attending the new facility at Golden Ring. All of the planned work is completed there. Demolition contract for the existing Victory Villa, uh, you had approved it on July 12th, and demolition is scheduled to start in September with the new school to be completed in August 2018. On the north northeast side, design for Northeast Area Elementary School on Joppa Road, uh, it is progressing satisfactorily and is going to be complete in August 2018. In the central area, addition of Padonia Elementary is scheduled for completion in 2018, and construction work at Dumbarton has started. Uh, there are a few concerns that community has raised about ensuring the protection of trees, <coughs> and we are working with the community to make sure that no damage is done to the trees. For the high school program, Pikesville and Hereford projects are already complete. Overly is progressing well. It's about 75% complete, and substantial completion is scheduled for April 2017. The four high school, Patapsco, Lansdowne, Woodlawn, and Delaney is progressing. The design work is going on, and we still have the target date of completion for August 2019. In addition to that, roofing project at Deer Park Elementary is complete, and construction has started at Chesapeake Terrace, Owings Mills, and there are nine roofing projects that are under design. In addition to roofing projects, there are 22 air conditioning projects in different stages of design that all will be completed uh, by 2018. All of the elementary and middle schools will be completed for air conditioning by 2018, and the high school, remaining two high school, to be completed in 2019. That completes my quick uh, uh, right. update on facilities. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Clearly, there's a, a lot of work going on. Is there anything, Mr. Dixit, that's keeping you up at night? I mean, any mm -hmm. particular project that's... Uh, all of uh, the projects are critical. Uh, I have the support of the superintendent, for which I'm very grateful, and I have an excellent team, so we'll meet on the timeline. Thank you. The support, I would just like to applaud the support of the board isn't a bad idea either, Pete. I asked uh, the chair um, if I could just have a, a few words, and I'll, I'll be very brief, I promise you. But Pete, I don't know if I've ever told you, but I'm extremely proud of you, man. Uh, you and your team are phenomenal. Um, I don't know if this, the board realizes or the community realizes, we place a lot of impossible tasks 
on our facilities department. And I will tell you, you have made the po impossible possible. I, I and <laughs> you, hear, you, hear, you hear Mr. Smith in the background, but I'm, t I'm telling you, you think about the massive nature of the operation. And that's why it's so important that this board does not get bogged down in small, mundane things when we have a $1.7 billion operation and you're about to have as your next agenda item almost $200 million of work that we put on the facilities department. And I will tell you, Pete, you've done a, a rock star of a job. Um, Thank you. And so Thank I you. appreciate you I and your team. I appreciate that, but I, I would be... Thank you very much, but I'd be remiss if I don't say the team that I have. It is the team that I'm very proud of. Uh, you do. I'm I was at Pikesville yesterday, and they were finishing up the punch list items. They were running over to West Town. They wanted to make sure the courtyard at Catonsville was all prepared, and they were helping teachers move boxes uh, into into to Rosedale and to Catonsville. So, man, great job. And it's you and your team, but you know, it takes leadership, and I appreciate you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Collins. Uh, before anything goes too far to your head, Pete, I, 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 won't, I won't give you any kind of a star until you get Kenwood air conditioned. When that happens, the design. I'll, give you a great, <laughs> I'll give you a great big star. Thank you. Chris, did you have a question? I, I would just like if we could get that report it emailed to us, the update of all the good news that Mr. Dixit just talk to us about there is no formal report that's mr dix's notes these are my notes i'll be more than glad to share with you okay thank you mr chairman i would just note parenthetically that i had suggested that we um take the recorded minutes and have them available in transcript oh, yeah, remember format that. <laughs> so that that type of uh, information would be readily available for anyone to cut and paste and use. I remember that. But that is just a passing observation on my part on the losing side <laughs> of that excellent suggestion. I, I was proud to be on the losing side with you. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Birch. Anything else? Uh, thank you. Um, our next uh, agenda item involves Mr. Sarah, so I guess you can continue up and bring up your rest of your uh, team. I'm going to ask uh, our, our budget director, Whit Tantliff, to introduce this item since we don't frequently do supplemental appropriations for capital projects. This will be a good opportunity for Whit to initiate himself. <laughs> All right. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, we're requesting tonight that the board approves uh, the FY17 appro uh, supplemental appropriation to the capital budget of $83,512,500 from the Baltimore County government. The total is a combination of uh, approximately $38.9 million in county funds and $44.6 million in anticipated state aid for air conditioning projects that are being forward funded. So in other words, the county's laying out that money with the expectation that the state will backfill it. Um, and within the 38.9 million of county funds, 20 million of it is unassigned reserve funds from our fund balance at the end of uh, FY16 and 18.94 million is from the Baltimore County General Fund appropriate, unappropriated balance. The 20 million transfer uh, from the BCPS fund balance, if you recall, was approved by this board on July 12th. The funds will be used to install air conditioning at uh, 12 schools, which you can see on your exhibit. Um, and the Baltimore County Council has already approved these funds in their supplemental appropriation on August 1st. Uh, that will bring our total capital uh, budget for FY17 to just about $330 million, which George and I were just discussing is probably the highest total of all time, but certainly in the last 10 years uh, that we went back and checked. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure there will be some discussion, but I was going to ask for a motion to approve the final year 2017 capital budget supplemental <coughs> appropriation. So moved. Do I have a second? All right. It's been moved and second. Is there any discussion or questions at this time? Ms. Causey? Um, I did have some questions. Um, I was not here at the uh, board meeting on July 12th. Um, 
So I will ask, uh, well, I just have a number of questions. Uh, number one, where we're talking about the uh, anticipated forward funding, what dollar amount is Baltimore County and the Board of Education expecting the state to fund and over what time frame? Well, it's $44.6 million. Um, and I don't, there's, there's not a, uh, a specific time frame for that. The, you know, the amount of state money available each year is from a finite bond issue. And so um, I think that it will take time to recover all of those monies along with their regular uh, capital appropriation that, uh, but over the next two fiscal years at least. So you're saying $44,572,500 will be requested of the state over the next two fiscal years. Right. And that's in addition to what would be our usual state request? Right. Correct. And what conversations have uh, BCPS administration had with the state in order to understand that that's a possibility? Uh, I don't believe that we've had any such conversations. Well, I, mean, I have we work, not. We work directly with the IEC, which, of course, as you know, has state representation on it all the time on all of our projects. It's important to know, too, though, that even though we get roughly 35 to $40 million every single year from the state, the state knows, and I say state meaning IAC, of course, which reports as projects to the Board of Public Works, they know the projects that we have in the pipeline and those that we have going forward in the future. Um, so they know that we are having a pretty aggressive timeline to put central air conditioning in our schools, and we've submitted that timeline to the state. But what assurance or do you have that the state will be able to fund that or that they're willing to fund that? So I think, as you probably know, the state's only going to talk about the current fiscal year because we go year to year and working with all of our projects. So the state knows right now, as we're putting forward our FY18 budget, what our state anticipated requests from them will be, which, you know, as we work with the IEC, they've shared with us that AC, of course, are projects that they would like to see first. But they also know that we have submitted high school projects as well as elementary projects as well, too, that are already funded on prior year's requests as well. Um, so while we can't anticipate what the final number um, from the state will be, we always know there'll be roughly at least 35 to 40 million. But these are also Baltimore County government dollars, not Baltimore County public school dollars that we're talking about in your question. Yes, I, I think Ms. Causey was talking specifically to the 46 the state. million. Yeah, the, the state. state. Yes. That's but the, you're right. But, but those, are, those are Baltimore County forward funded dollars, not Baltimore County public schools forward funded dollars. Yes. And it's always I, important to realize, too, that, that you know, at least since I've been here, and I know if I go back to, to Dr. Harrison's tenure, anything that the state has not funded, Baltimore County government has stepped up to the plate to complete the funding. So no project has been delayed for a lack of state funding, or I should say for a lack of the funding requests from the state. So that there won't be any chance that we would start down this path of starting all of these construction projects and then not having the funds available to complete I, them? I will tell you, since I've been here and I've gone back to Dr. Harrison's tenure, any time that the county has said that it's willing to complete a project, if the state has not completed its funding request from us or, you know, they have stepped up to the plate. So I, I, we submit this request to you for FY17, which is the current fiscal year, and the FY18 you're going to approve next, knowing that once we put these projects forward, the county has given us a commitment that it's going to complete those projects. Okay, but if it's over the next two fiscal years. If you think about Kimwood High School, you think about Franklin High School, it's gonna take two years to complete those projects. Right, um, but the point is, is that in 2018, we're having elections in the current uh, county council and county executive, well, the county executive's term limited, so we're gonna have a new county executive. But the current county executive but, will be submitting a budget that will actually be still in his term for FY19. Right. So that once that's approved, we're still able to count on those funds to continue these construction projects. I believe that the board can rest assured that what it's approving for 17 and approving for 18 will be completed. In addition, uh, the current administration and the county council would be seated when the FY19 budget is put forward for the county. Okay. Then my next question uh, is around the $20 million of unassigned reserve funds from BCPS fund balance. Um, 
and again, I wasn't at that meeting on July 12th, was there discussion around where is that $20 million going to come from? Sorry. Well, I think it's already stated it's coming from our, your, the board's un, unassigned fund balance, um, which, let me just be clear, the board technically does not have money. We end the balance each year with zero. Uh, it goes back to the county. The county has allowed us to use these unassigned funds for the forward funding of AC projects. But the board has substantial discussion um, that I think is noted on video. Okay, so the, but the $20 million, when you say unassigned, what that really means is that we, a budget was approved by the board for exact amount of dollars. So in order for dollars to become unassigned, certain programs or no, employees... That, that mean that. No, At Are the end of every year, we're going to have savings in our budget anyway, just because if you think about the number of employees, which of course is over 80% of our budget, you know, you're not going to have all positions filled at every single moment. Um, when the board approves a budget, we have actually been, since I've been here, and George, correct me if I'm mm -hmm. wrong, um, we've always came right around 20 to $25 million every year that's in our fund balance that we've not spent. We're not going to spend the money just because we have it. Those funds then begin to roll over. If you look at the, what the county and working with us have done, they've took, taken parts of the fund balance to fund part of the next year in terms of revenue. Um, but because of fiscal conservative, uh, that, the fiscal conservatism that we've had over the last four years, we have a sizable amount and fund balance where we could say we could take $20 million from that and still have a very substantial amount still to be able to look at for revenue or for other projects that the, that the board or the counties deemed in, in the future. Okay, because... So we're not cutting programs to, to your question to get that $20 million. Okay, but in the past there have been key positions that have been vacant for lengths of time, including transportation director. We had an acting uh, safety director. Yeah, but I wouldn't equate that to the budget, though. That's because we were trying to find the right people to fill those roles. Well, I, I don't know what I'm not equating it to anything. I'm just saying that when you're talking about I just don't want us to make $20 million. I don't want us to make an assumption on that. But let's say, for example, if you take about the fact that, um, you know, we did not have a director of transportation in the role, we had someone fulfilling those responsibilities. But that salary savings right there because we had not officially hired somebody for the role, that money would actually go towards savings at the end of the year. But I wouldn't want to equate the fact that we are not filling uh, positions to, to get a fund balance. We just had not found the right talent for the position. Mr. Chairman. Um, just, I'd just like to interject well, for a second, <clears throat> uh, okay. Kathleen. Don't worry too much about the fiscal soundness of what's going on because, uh, you know, both the state of Maryland and Baltimore County have AAA bond ratings. And the last time it was announced, uh, it may have gone up now because the economy has improved in some states, but, but mm -hmm. only, only four states out of the 50 uh, had AAA bond ratings from the bonding houses in uh, in New York, indicating fiscal prudence in so far as um, their their management of their of their money. So and the county uh, was a, was a, a small number of of uh, they, one of about forty. Yeah, they do it by they do it by uh, size of the subdivisions too. I've seen that breakdown, but I mean, really the the the, the management of our money is is really. Um, well done. Now, admittedly, people complain about they wish we didn't pay so many taxes, but until you talk about services, then they all want the services, as we all know. But um, so, you know, really, I don't think there's anything to worry about as far as these things happening. Because once, you know, the heavy lifting's been done, getting them in place, and then, and then I agree with the superintendent, although I was uh, picking on Pete as I have been for forever, and um, about making sure Kenwood gets done, but um, but you know I mean everything's okay. <laughs> Any other uh, questions um, at this time, uh, Mr. Birch? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to note that it was a year ago that uh, I joined um, the superintendent and some board members who were traveling with him at Middle River Middle School, possibly on August 24th. One of the um, one of the warmest uh, first day of classes uh, in my recollection. Uh, I don't think I shook a dry hand in that in Middle River Middle School, <laughs> and I remember staff coming to me, uh, sh shaking a hand that was as moist as mine, <laughs> saying, "Can you please get some movement on some kind of relief for our school?" And I remember following up with um, uh, Kevin Smith, who was actually there. 
among other things, testing doors that were supposed to have been repaired just to make sure they got repaired in time for school to open. And um, uh, there was some interest about uh, whether there was already ventilation in place. The, the, uh, the, if you will, the ventilating infrastructure for the school was already there. And a teacher had said, I know it's there. I saw him. And um, Mr. Smith went and had a specialist go and look. And it simply wasn't going to be what would be needed to air condition. And with this supplemental appropriation, I'm pleased to be able to say with the approval of this board, we'll be able to, to, to let those staffers at uh, Middle River Middle School and those students who are attending know that there is going to be movement. And I note that there are some other older schools, the original Kenwood, Golden Ring Middle School, another one of our six district schools is listed here. Orms Elementary School, not as old as uh, the original Kenwood, uh, uh, but Orms nonetheless. Uh, needing air conditioning. Uh, schools in the southeast, in um, um, uh, June Eaton's uh, area. This is a significant effort on the part of this board, the county executive and the county council to have movement. And uh, I, I think it's a cause for good conversation on the front end, because I know when that is installed, there's going to be a lot of folks who are going to be a lot, lot cooler in these schools. And I think there's going to be, there's going to be more learning going on. Right. And in fairness, it's, it, in fairness it's, it's also, you know, we all, if, if we follow the news, we know, we know about political rivalries. But in, in, fa in fairness, the, the, state of, the state of Maryland, meaning our legislators and Governor Hogan, uh, they're, they're on board with, with um, all, all of these efforts as well. So we really, you know, uh, I once again will quote the last sentence in that Sun Paper editorial when they talked about it several weeks ago. Uh, there's really enough good things happening that there's plenty of credit for everyone. And I think in fairness as a body that seeks help from all agencies, all levels rather, we, we, we need to mention Governor Hogan and our state legislators mm -hmm. as well as County Executive Kamenetz and our county legislators. Um, for meaning the county council for all, the, all of the dedication to education in Maryland. I mean, <coughs> when we go to the national convention and talk about funding, yeah, no. they just look at us like, what, what, this doesn't happen anywhere in the world. What, you know, they, so, so we have to look keep this in perspective. Counties. Look at our surrounding counties there. Ms. Miller, do you have a county. comment? Yes. Um, Question. So, how much did we? How much was our original request to the state for FY 2017? Um, do you have that? Well, it, you mean for capital or? Yes. The 149 <coughs> million is that? You mean for fiscal 18? No, 17. Because this is an I amendment to 17. 17. Uh, so I'm wondering. Um, what I want to know is, what's the total now? This. With well, the it's 40. 330 million now. No, the state yeah, request you asked was 59. State state's 94 now. 94. So it went from what to what? 40. 94. 40. So it went to 50. Yeah. It was from 50. Yeah. Approximately. So we're increasing our fiscal year 17 request to the state? So we're, asking, we're having a couple conversations. This, this action is not changing the total on the FY17. It's actually allocating the funding to move into that. So the funding, the, the capital for 17 requests is not changing by $20 million. That's not what's happening. This is getting the dollars, moving the dollars so that the county can forward fund that action. So we're not adding $20 million to the capital, to the FY17 capital plan. It is full funding county dollars in lieu of state dollars as they're requested over the next cap, the next two capital years. Okay, but we are then going to be requesting that additional $44 million from the state. In future so years. In future years. years. That, in that future years. That is not going to change because it's part of the capital plan for 17 and for 18. It's going to represent all of the AC projects, which the state share will be somewhere in the neighborhood of $44 million. So that request won't change. It's just the $20 million that you're, the action yeah. that you're voting on now is giving the county and the schools the ability to forward fund those dollars in lieu of those actual dollars coming in from the state. Is that taken into account for the FY 2018? This 44 million, is that taken into account for FY 2018? That is all of the AC projects yes. currently through the 
completion of the 34 schools. So yes, that is. So, so this uh, this 175 for FY 2018 includes the 44 yes. million. Yes. It does. Yes. Yes. Okay. Those projects. Um, it, it's just confusing here. Um, so the, so the original budget, capital budget, was 246 million. Uh, 49.9 million of which was state funded, and 196 million of which was county funded. So by adding the 84 million, we go from 246 to 330 million. Okay, um, and you've stated that the county has already approved this. 44.6 million. The 44.6 million plus the other amount. Um, plus the 38.9. 38, so they've already approved all of that. Yes, they appropriated it. That, that is cash that is available regardless of when the state is able to reimburse. Or if. Correct. I mean, they're, they're putting themselves on it's, the hook. It's Correct. going to be Regardless spent long before we get reimbursed if okay. so. Um. It's not unusual to have the county front load any project before they actually get the funding from the, from the state. That happens all the time, even in, in renovation projects and other projects. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, the, you're absolutely the, right. The state, okay. right. We, but we can, the county, puts the dollars up, and eventually it, the state catches up, we get the money back. But the forward funding happens almost every year uh, on other projects. It has to, to keep projects going. Right, for, because, for because by, by the time you get the money, if you notice, when you're doing a renovation, look at these schools of, let's say, $40 million, you don't see $40 million on here, because the way it's funded is that the state gives you the money that you're going to spend during that fiscal year. And then next year, you're going to get what they spend until the project is complete. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think I've learned that over the years. <laughs> that, that's the way it goes. That's right. that's they right. base it on a cash flow right. Right. On a cash base system. So they might approve ultimately spending $10 million on Kenwood air conditioning, we hope. But they're only going to give us $3 million a year for however long it takes to do the construct the actual construction they're not giving us 10 million and letting us sit on it for three years so by by matching the funding with the cash flow they're able to leverage the total amount of um, money that they have available okay I mean I'm just concerned because we're asking for a huge uh, you know state allotment here for FY 2018, and so then it makes me wonder, if all of this doesn't come through, what is going to be the status for these projects? So um, I, I think that question was answered earlier. The county has made, when we develop our capital budget, we do it in collaboration with the county because, let's be honest, between them and the state, they're our fiscal agents. So when we put a project down, we're anticipating to get the maximum state participation we can. If not, though, the county is committing itself to completing those projects, regardless of whether they get the money from the state or not. So again, approving this and the FY18, what we're going to ask you, the county is saying we're go they're going to complete those projects. So there's no apprehension around whether those projects will be completed or not. Well, there is one remaining, and let me just express it. Um, this. T um, 2017 I mean this is great the counties you know committing themselves to this and they're on the hook for it so I mean why would we ever say no Correct. the Correct. issue is for me this sets us down the road for these central AC projects uh, because they'll be starting they'll be starting for this you know this money so then the 2018 we're asking for this another huge 175 million when we normally get per dr dance 35 to 40. So we, we, uh, uh, but let me finish so my concern then is okay we'll start we'll commit it commit ourselves and then will we be able to finish and then what will happen to that schedule for ac the central ac projects 
county has when when we could have done the portable already right. you know or be in process I'm, I'm just concerned about that we're setting ourselves down that road the county has already forward funded all air conditioning projects because all air conditioning projects. I mean, we're in design phase for these projects now in prior years we get an allocation for ac projects as we go the few projects we go the county has been working with dr dance and the state has said we're going to completely fund all of the remaining ac projects forward funding so the capital program that is in front of you now the 17 plus the one that we're asking for consideration on tonight those two capital programs will fully complete all of the ac projects that are standalone to include those projects that are part of renovations and new schools so that as those new schools come offline which may not necessarily be all in 17 and 18 some of them may exceed to, to 19 all of the ac projects will be funded in a very in an unprecedented one failed cash infusion to get them all done so that the fears that you're having they're removed because now they're not throwing a few projects at your time at a time and saying do these and we'll address the others later all of them are addressed in the 17 and the 18 <coughs> capital plan to include those projects that may exceed further than that which are the high school projects that are going to be in the renovation so I, I hear what you're saying but the old premise is no longer at play here that premise is gone because now they're saying where, what is the total number you need to complete all of the AC projects and what is the state share and what is the local share and the, and the, and the, the county has said we understand the two shares we're going to full fund all of it and work our re reimbursements out as we move along okay thank you and the, and the final solution Ann, would, would be if, if for some unthought of reason all we would have to do is just put a little extra tax on the Hereford zone and everything would be fine. Yeah, because we're just, you know, with but that's where money the money is on trees. Up yeah, that's there. where the money is, so we would just hurry up there and, and, and uh, work it all out. I think Towson is uh, where you would head. All right, I'm going to ask for a motion to uh, approve the transfer of the fiscal year 2017 budget supplemental appropriation. So moved. Oh, we, had, we already had, had a oh, okay. oh. Just okay. time for the vote. Oh, yeah, that's right. We did. All right. Yeah, it's been so long. Yeah, it's been so long. So long. I'm so, I totally yeah. forgot. <laughs> All right. All in favor, please raise your hand. Asian cannot vote. Asian cannot vote. Okay. I know. So it's, uh, it is unanimous okay. uh, from those who uh, are voting. All right. Uh, thank you. And our, our next agenda item is the uh, FY17. I'm sorry. I can't even read at this point. FY18 capital budget. Uh, issue and um, I guess we still have Mr. Saris and Mr. Smith is up at the table. Chairman McDaniel, Vice Chair Gillis, Dr. Dance and members of the board. First, thank you for what you did tonight for my team who I work with every day. Facilities does a yeoman's job but guess what? I got five other sections that are knocking it dead for you right now and I appreciate this because I tell them thank you all the time but sometimes they need to hear it from you because all the calls you get is what happens bad. But I can assure you, they're doing a lot of good things and you hear some of the bad. So thank you for telling them how much you appreciate what they do every day. Because I do, and I, I, I'm, I'm proud to say I stand with this team because this is a good team and they have some really tough jobs and what I try to do is get out of their way and let them do what they do because I have some outstanding folks, men and women that work for you every single day. So what you said today, whether you know it or not, they're gonna hear it tomorrow, they're gonna hear it next week and they're gonna hear the day after that your, your support of them is important. So thank you. Um, Tonight we're bringing to you the uh, a work session related to the FY18 state capital request. It sounds as if most of our discussion previously has addressed most of the, the, uh, the, the germane points that we want to have here now, but I have Mr. Saris and Mr. Dixon here, Dixon here who will walk you through the final points of what the new FY18 request is consistent with our priorities and working very closely with the state and the county on making sure that 
the very aggressive timelines that we have for a host of projects, AC, new con uh, construction for growth, additions, renovations, all of the roof projects are all inclusive in this FY18, which is a continuation of the FY17 work that is already taking place. That's why what you're gonna see are, are a lot of consistent projects moving through this particular capital request. Um, in addition to that, as you can see, all of the great work that's taking place with these projects, all of the day-to-day -day stuff is happening with all of these departments, so we just wanna go through them now. Um, at this time, I'll turn it over to Pete, who will go through the request for you and will address any questions that you may have at that time. As part of your package, uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. As part of your package, you have an exhibit for the fiscal 18 request for the state capital funds. And as you will see, the top 12 projects are the air conditioning projects. They have been prioritized. And part of the rationale is that the need for air conditioning is urgent. And based on cash flow, this is where we are going to need the money first. We know that all of this $175 million from the state side cannot come in one year more than likely. So we, in talking with the county partners, have prioritized projects based on need and based on need of cash to complete those projects on time. So the first 12 projects are air conditioning. You have already approved uh, Padonia International as part of the addition, and that's the uh, priority 13. Then Victory Villa, Lansdowne, Northeast Elementary, and after that, all of the four high schools that are in design stage. Um, and, and then the replacement school for Dundalk Elementary, Berkshire, and then two roof replacement for Orems and Timber Grove. So this is our total request, totaling $175 million from state. The first year part of that 175 is 149 million. When we lay the cash flow of that 175 based on need, it'll be the 149 in the first year and the remaining balance in the second year, which will perhaps be part of our fiscal 2019 request. All of these projects have been committed by county for forward funding. So as we need, the money will be available to complete the projects on our schedule, and gradually it'll be, the state share will be reimbursed back to us. That's a quick summary of what our request is. The other point that I want to emphasize, that this entire process is a dynamic process. It keeps changing, the amounts will change, and it needs adjusting. Mm -hmm. It is some confusing part in there too, and that's why from time to time we'll come here, share with you what changes have been made, why they have been made, and what's the impact of those changes on our schedule. That's a, a quick, if, they, the, if there's any question on this, I'll be glad to answer now. All right, uh, Ms. Miller had a, has a question. I might, I might get a little redundant here. Yeah. Um, this reminds me of when I go to do our laundry and my kids give me nothing, give me nothing, give me, and then finally I force them to clean their rooms and then they pile on a mountain of laundry and then I'm expected to deal with that request, should we say. Um, this 175 million is almost five times what we normally get from the state. And I understand it makes sense to request more, but maybe not that much more. I, I, that scares me a bit. So uh, walk me through this process. If um, we've prioritized the air conditioning first. That's right. And the state will fund based on our priority That's correct. schedule. So if they fund their normal 40 million, 35 million, whatever it is, um, the air conditioning will still be taken care of because the county's forward funding it. Forward funded. So would then the state money go down to item number 13 and start at that point? State money is authorized on the project basis. So their money will be for a specific project not a bucket of money that we can use any other place. It's not a block grant, 
It's a project by project allocation. They asked, they asked the LEAs to prioritize their entire capital that they submit. The state can fund whichever projects they deem they're going to fund. It could be a handful of the air projects. It could be a handful of the renovations. It could be a handful of the um, uh, um, roof replacements, whatever it be. So they, they do it based on their cash flowing. So it doesn't necessarily mean that <coughs> the top 12 items we have there is going to get all of the all of our allocation. It's saying that if you this is our priority based on our need and the time to deliver that need. So it doesn't put others in front. It, that because we started at 12 with, uh, I mean, at 13 with Padonia, it doesn't mean that the need is not there. It's saying based on the time when the others have to be delivered, we have to prioritize those in order to get the others delivered. Right, but the state's going to follow our priority here, right? But they're going to so fund. They're going to fund let's based on. Say the state gives us 44 million. Mm -hmm. They're going to start at number one and then fund all of these air conditioning projects, perhaps, mm -hmm. let's just say. Mm -hmm. And then the money's going to run out. What happens to the rest of the projects? The rest of the projects will continue to design and build, and county has agreed to forward fund those projects. And let's put this in perspective. The county's funding this in advance. It, it, things are based on timing. So They're we know that AC in advance, minute, we right? know that this hundred and seventy five million or whatever it is, in time we will get. Remember, the county and the state they, they live on forever. So <laughs> if it takes three years to get the money or four years, it, it, as long as it's forward funded by the county, we shouldn't concern ourselves too much. It's going to be funded. You, was, you said that happening. you said they have only agreed to fund Air conditioning project. Is that right? They have agreed to fund all of these projects in all this project. The, in and this they have done it in the past too. So I think, to Ms. Miller's credit, I think we mixed up a lot of last discussion, mm -hmm. saying that the county was forward funding AC projects. The county historically has forward funded all, all projects. projects. So that if it's on this list, they're going to get done. You know, we'll go back and forth with the state, and the dollar amount will change. And I think the board recognized that last year. The amounts will change as we go throughout the process. When the four high schools come back from bid, the dollar amounts may change there. But the county historically has said, if we've agreed that it should go on your capital request, remember, this is just a state. We're going to come back to you in a, in a couple of months with the county request that's going to match this and may have some additional projects on it. But we're committing to completing those projects regardless of the final dollar amount we receive from the state, AC, renovation, replacement um, projects or even root projects. Okay, so let me understand the process then. So then once the state comes back and, and gives us the figure that they're going to fund, do we then ever, do we reprioritize perhaps? I mean, they're going to fund certain, do, and, when, and if we do reprioritize, does the board have to approve that the, new schedule? The priority comes once a year. We submit this based on your approval. We submit this to state. State fund some of the project, not all of the project. Next year, we resubmit the next year's program, which may have some of these priorities, or we, we, we may want to adjust, readjust some of those priorities, but you will get a chance to approve it. Okay. It takes some time for the state the IEC as well as our team to evaluate all of these projects through their process. So that's why sometimes the, the numbers change because as the projects get evaluate, evaluated by the IEC, it may be things that they include and things that they don't. But relatively speaking, this is an estimate based on where we are with these projects based on how the state and local share break out now. It's done once a year. And then next year, we'll have a submission for 19 that may be inclusive of a lot of these projects also, and also could include additional projects that are in the next capital plan out. So it, it happens once a year, but the adjustment of the dollar amounts between the state are, are worked out as the state goes through its various levels of approval that it goes from A, B to C. And then when it's completed, then the funding is developed. 
Okay, I'm just trying to wrap my head around. Not a problem. We, that's what we're here for. Um, if you remember last year, the county committed $80 million for the four high school renovations. Those funds are also cash available, and that's why those projects are designing and moving forward simultaneously, even though we won't have a decision on the state funding for those four projects. Okay, so once the funding is approved, we move forward on the project. So with the county forward funding all of this, we're gonna be moving forward on all of this. We have already moved forward on the design of these four projects. But and I mean, all, all of the all design. Of this, we're moving Just forward. Just about all of these projects, we have moved ahead on the design. Okay. Without board approval, or the board approved it at some other point? So if you look at Lansdowne, you guys just got the schematic design tonight. That was on your 17 request. 17. Yeah, you approved you approved a lot of these projects last year. The only two projects that are new are in Miss Eden's district. When you have Dundalk and Berkshire's <laughs> replacement schools. These are and your roof replacements. Everything else is continuation projects. And we have Raise not the roof, Miss Eden. School tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We have school tomorrow. Great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let's speed tomorrow. it up here. Miss uh, Brad had a question too that uh, you wanted. I just, yeah, I just had a. Quick clarification question because I know I don't vote or anything on this, but um, were these assumed commitments? Because you're saying historically the county has uh, for funded, but is this like something that they've actually said? It's they all hand in glove. So yeah, the they, they agree to them. So every Kevin. year, what you'll learn uh, is that our budget process is a 12 month process. So we're constantly talking to the county around based on our enrollment projections, where might seats be needed, based on you know AC, where modernizations need to occur. And then we're constantly putting projects in, in the pipeline. So some of these projects were projects we started talking about back in 14, yes. that now as we're starting to clear up additional projects and projects have been completed, we're adding new projects to the pipeline now. So if you go back to when the county executive rolled out his FY17 budget, he included money for several new projects, including several in Miss Eden's district. Now we're starting to put those on the capital plan around there. Um, it, when the county has said they're going to do a project, we recognize the fact that we're going to get roughly, you know, 35 to $40 million from the state. Some years we've gotten more depending on wherever the state's picture is because it is a finite dollar amount. What the county has said is because we've agreed to these projects with you, we're going to complete these projects. And so since I've been here, and again, going back to Dr. Harrison's notes, we've been able to complete those projects on time. And the state number looks like a big number, but because the state does look at it in terms of cash flow dollars, they're able to complete more projects for the state and be able to help us with projects over, over a period of time. Ms. Causey, and, and then we do have another meeting next week on this uh, yeah. topic yes. to follow up, so we can... You'll love this. I, I have a question, which I'll hold for a moment, but I, might I make a suggestion that if we submit questions to you, Mr. McDaniel, that you will get the staff to uh, prepare those for us and get them to us um, ahead of the August 30th meeting um, so that we'll have those questions answered. I know that we have also received from the community a number of concerns that um, I was hoping to address uh, tonight, but at this late hour, and we do, have, we do all have school in the morning, um, if we can get written answers, say in a week, 10 days, what's today? Um, it's, it's seven days from today. I think the board has to ask itself. I mean, because we answered the questions that you submitted tonight. The, does the board want all of that information in, in writing? And does the board feel that staff's time is best spent that way? I mean, if the board submits questions to us, we absolutely have incorporated every single answer. And I've gone through my list that you sent to make sure those have been incorporated. So the question I would say to the board is, does it want us to submit in this weekly update or in some other type of communication in writing responses to every single board question on capital projects? Yes. <laughs> Well, if we discussed it tonight, I mean, we have the record uh, of the discussion. I don't think we want to... No, I mean, any additional questions? I had a number of questions, but I'm saying in the interest of time, in the interest of closing the meeting... Um, well, well, we don't I mean, know there what, were also a number of emails. We, we haven't seen the quote. We don't know if they're... what, how extensive they are. And Let's I say a reasonable a, number of questions. But there is a... There's another work session on the 30th. I know, I'm just saying in the interest of time, if questions are submitted in advance, that they, they can, can be present answered. The answers there, yeah. but not to, it would seem to me to be Redundant. That's less over. helpful. That's less helpful in terms of evaluating. But I mean, it's I, I the board's <clears throat> decision what the majority. 
I feel is appropriate. I have a lot of respect for, for Kathleen and, and Anne for digging in and seeking yes. to understand the intricacies of the capital budget, and I mean that sincerely. But I, Kathleen, I think, uh, take a half a loaf here. <coughs> let, let them know your questions, but don't, don't ask for any answers in writing. Well, let's give them a heads up on what you want to ask about so they'll, uh, you know, have time to think about it for next week uh, because we added that extra meeting to give us more time to discuss the capital budget, if you recall. Right. And there'll be no so, vote next week yeah. either. Right. So, no so, vote. so just, just um, you know, just go for a half a loaf. Okay. Submit, submit I do the have questions. one question uh, that is about the educational facilities uh, master plan that was voted on and approved in June, and we were supposed to receive an update because there was a report in there that was missing and it was not updated for um, this new uh, yeah. plan. Let me answer that question. Uh, state requires educational facility master plan, which is submitted in July with your approval. There are things that happen after that or before the preparation of the master plan. All of those items will be submitted to state as an amendment when we meet them in the first week of October. Okay, and so the board has not received an update on the Educational Facilities Master and Plan. And we'll be more than glad to share that amendment with you before submitting it to, to the state. We have never done that before because in the meeting of October, they'll have additional questions. And in the interest of time and efficiency, we have always responded to all their questions when we meet with them next time. If the board desires to get their approval every time they ask a question and every time we provide an answer, I don't know if that will be efficient use of time for you and for us. I'm not saying for approval. Yeah. I'm just saying as a point of information, the board voted on something with the anticipation of getting an update. The point we of were, information is we were told is we would get an update. I think this is where the board tried to pick up at its retreat. What yeah. information does the board want from me and staff so we can provide it to the board? I mean, if, if we update you, and meaning you mean the board, every single thing that happens in the school system, you will get 45 to 50 emails a day from us. The board has got to come together and say, this is the information we want. That document you're talking about is going to change at least 10 times That's right. over the course of the year as we're working with the IEC on those projects. Yes, but the board voted to approve that mm -hmm. EFMP, knowing that it was missing a report and knowing that it was inaccurate because it had not incorporated the change that the county executive presented in the, excuse me, in the May 18th press release. So the board voted yes based on getting an update to the report that was missing and to the corrections. So I think the board did vote and did ask for it. So I I'm just, Dixon just I'm not asking for we everything. We can provide that attachment to you, but it's going to yes. change. I think Mr. Dixon just answered that. Yeah. Yes, please provide um, it. Thank I, I, you. We'll be more than glad to do that. We can put that in the weekly yeah. to the board, but just FYI to the board, it will change. We know that. All All right. Our next uh, agenda. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. And thank we you very will much. Follow up next uh, Tuesday on the 30th. Done yet? All right. We're. we're uh, yes. Um, we. We. Uh, we do have a number of staff here. I know you have to get ready for tomorrow's school. So, um, uh, if you would like to. Uh, uh, leave at this time. Those of you who have to get, but we uh, we do have one agenda item <laughs> item to go nice. through. We have board member comments, uh, and I'll start with Miss Eaton over that side of the room. All right, Miss <laughs> Williams, uh, do you have any? Miss Williams, any comments? Oh, um, <laughs> summer school. Uh, graduation was wonderful. I really salute Dr. Dance for his vision and having summer school graduation. Outstanding. Ms. Causey? Um, I also wanted to say congratulations to the summer graduates. Um, I also wanted to say welcome to the new teachers. Um, I would um, encourage them, as others had, um, that they um, can reach out to the others in their building. I was um, very touched at the uh, TABCO um, retirement dinner where they also do a rookie recognition of new teachers that are doing outstanding work. And they spoke about how supportive other teachers were to them in the school building, not just the official mentors. So please go out and get the support that you need. 
um, and we're wishing a great start to the school year tomorrow for everyone. Um, and I do want to say that I appreciate to teachers and parents and students and other stakeholders that have reached out to me. Please continue to do so and um, even more would be great. Also in starting the new year, uh, parents participating in the PTA and also advisory councils is a great way for them to get answers to questions, to offer suggestions and to get involved to help improve the school system. Um, I also wanted to touch on the um, heat closure policy. We have gotten a number of emails uh, this week. Um, I want to say I'm wearing red tonight to stand in solidarity with Delaney High School, who is the um, high school in my district that does not have enough air conditioning for the students. So we're hoping for a really cool fall. Uh, but I did want to start by saying that the heat closure policy um, has not created inequitable learning environments. Rather, it is the inequitable conditions of facilities across the county that has fostered inequitable learning environments for years. The heat closure policy acknowledges those inequities and strives to protect the health and safety of students and teachers in those schools without sufficient air conditioning. The heat closure policy was not created lightly nor rashly. Policy Review Committee had worked on this issue since September 2015. There was research done, a community hearing was held, as well as continuous, continuous stakeholder input from parents, teachers, students, administrators, and others. PRC considered input through emails, phone calls, Facebook pages, public comment at board meetings, county council meetings, public forums coordinated by Comptroller Francho, public comments at Board of Public Work meetings in Annapolis, interagency committee for school construction meetings. Input was given from elected officials, including county council, county executive, delegates, senators, Treasurer Nancy Kopp, Comptroller Peter Francho, Lieutenant Governor Boyd Rutherford, and Governor Larry Hogan. Additionally, many uh, elected officials and board members have toured these different schools throughout BCPS. Additionally, the policy was modified in August to close only non-air conditioned schools after Dr. Dance arranged for waivers of required school days from State Superintendent Karen Salmon. I have requested the details of those waivers for Dr. Dance to provide to the whole board. Ultimately, is the Maryland State Department of Education regulation of days and hours of required student attendance that will determine the number of days a school system stays open in the same way that MSDE regulates time off that we have now related to snow closures. It will be up to the state superintendent to grant those waivers if needed. Also, in preparation for implementation of Policy 6303, the PRC had recommended changes to the 2015-2016 calendar to allow for extra days, if needed, for heat closures, and the full board approved those changes. The use of multiple zip codes in the policy was to evaluate excessive heat and humidity in all the different areas of the county. So be clear that any non-air conditioned school will close per the policy no matter what zip code it is in. Um, additionally, the superintendent will, uh, as with other policies, develop rules and procedures to implement this policy. Some of the concerns that I have heard and suggestions that have been made uh, can be uh, considered, which would be, do teachers report? If they can get planning and grading work done without students, they may be able to leverage instruction time better when students return to school. Also, there could be uh, consideration for procedures for work sent home in anticipation of high heat or for links to classwork or homework digitally so students could continue some work at home. Um, so those were some of the concerns and questions that I heard and I do appreciate the um, board passing the policy and we are uh, encouraged by the increased focus on facilities um, and getting the schools operating in the same learning environments. Um, I do want to say that the facility issues are not just related to air conditioning. We have overcrowding. We have water that the students don't want to drink. We've started to address that last year, and I appreciate Kevin Smith and his uh, folks that are now filling the bottled water stations in those schools where the water is unacceptable. Um, I also just want to say that there have been concerns raised from the community about the new grading policy, about transportation, and about teacher uh, recruitment and retention, and that this year uh, those issues will be addressed, um, it is my hope. So uh, with that, I will say good night and thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Yofelder? You know, we don't know how good we have it. Uh, last week, um, our president, uh, was invited to a roundtable uh, by the Baltimore Jewish Council in addition to the chairman of the Baltimore City School Commissioners. 
and Marisol and I went. And we, we don't have any problems. You ought to hear what the school, what this Baltimore City school system has done. They got $2 billion two years ago from the state uh, to construct new schools, and they haven't even started. It, it, it's incredible how um, disorganized they are. I don't know how the hell else to say it. I mean, they got a reverse problem. Uh, they have 85,000 students, and they have 175 school buildings. We have 113,000, and we only have 175 school buildings. So they can't figure out which ones they must close. It, it, it's incredible. And Chuck did a great job. Um, I felt sorry for the, <laughs> for the guy from Baltimore City because it, it, when you compare it, when you hear what Chuck said, and then you hear what he said, and you hear what the questions are, it, we're, we're in pretty good shape. Right, thank Thanks. You. And thank you, Chuck. It was oh, great. Thank you. Mr. Gillis? I'm with Ms. Eaton. <laughs> Hazelin, anything for the good of the group? Um, have a great 2016-2017 school year, everybody. Thank you. Mr. Collins? Uh, I know Steve's going to comment on this. Uh, Steve and I uh, <clears throat> lost a very close friend uh, who uh, was a teacher in Baltimore County, a retired educator, Mrs. Regina Robbins, who died much too young. Um, and I just... Uh, worked so closely with her on so many things that Ken would during her years there. She was a superb teacher. She moved on to Perry Hall and finished her career there. But I just want her husband Larry and the, mm. her sons uh, Ian and Fletcher to know that every single day to this day, when I get on the elevator at work, I always say what Regina used to say and drive her kids to distraction because they would tell me about it all the time. I always say, happy Monday. That was Regina. She had a vibrant presence, and she will be deeply, deeply missed. Thank you, Mike. Um, I just want to say have a good school year, and specifically to my four kids that I could not tuck in tonight, um, Antoine, Nevea, Nalani, and Nylea, I love you. Thank you. Ms. Miller? Kids, get to bed early. I know uh, <laughs> parents are doing the happy dance tonight, and uh, have a great school year. Thank you. Uh, th uh, three very brief uh, topics. One, uh, for those uh, many folks in the Prairie Hall area and served by the Prairie Hall Middle School, um, I, I've seen your emails. I've talked with Julia, uh, Julie Hen, uh, with the Northeast uh, Advisory Council. Um, I have uh, communicated with the superintendent. Uh, when the dust settles, we can um, talk about uh, the future on that matter. Please keep um, uh, your interest uh, active and shared. Uh, secondly, um, next month the superintendent uh, has indicated that he'll be bringing information to the board about a matter that many parents have spoken to us in a, at a board meetings about uh, discipline and, and uh, I know many of you that I've spoken with about uh, discipline in our schools um, uh, really under the rubric of order preceding discipline. Uh, and it being an essential part of, of the mission of BCPS. So I'll be looking very forward to the superintendent's sincere comments because I know that, that this is a matter of importance to him. Lastly, the condolences uh, that uh, I share with Mike Collins, the family and, and many friends, uh, many students of which I'm proud to, to have been one, uh, of Regina Robbins uh, and her, her dear, dear friend, another uh, English uh, teacher of mine, Gail Koslowski huber uh, who shared a uh, love of literature with Regina, as well as a certain uh, television soap opera that I'm told they may have watched in the faculty room uh, during uh, shared lunchtime. Regina Robbins, who, uh, channeling Ernest Hemingway, would tell us uh, in our journals to write whatever we wanted, but be certain you wrote at least one true thing. <laughs> so again, uh, my condolences and, of course, my, my great gratitude to her for um, all the many lessons she shared uh, with me at Kenwood. Thank you. Thank you, board members. And uh, just note for information, there's a report from our retreat um, included in your information. Uh, I'd ask that you sign the documents that Andy has over at the table before you leave. And certainly, again, we hope that many of you can get out on school day, uh, first day of school tomorrow. Our next board meeting is Tuesday, August 30th. Schools is closed Labor Day. And I do believe we have a curriculum meeting tomorrow. Tomorrow, 5 o'clock. Yes. So meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.